are we are the midwives of mystery and the doctor. Yay! And we are a group that was enigmatically put together here at Agape for just some magical, mystical reason, and it keeps happening, we keep coming back, and now we decide to make it formal. We are the midwives of mystery. <laughs> bring energy and warmth and love and deliver mystery into this world. Yeah. So And we love group participation. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we want everyone to sing along and the more energy the better. So with that being said, we're going to be saying love will guide us and we want to guide the beautiful energy of the day to us now. <laughs> Um, this is a song by Sally Rogers. Um, if you know it, please do join us, especially the chorus needs more voices. Introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome, uh, returning friends. Welcome, new friends to uh, Agape's annual Francis Day event. Um, what a beautiful day this is, right? <laughs> <laughs> While the rain may be an inconvenience, it nourishes us, right? It makes us present and mindful of how we rely on Earth and Earth's beautiful uh, ways. So, with that said, let's just start with a deep inhale. Um, maybe you want to close our eyes and just have a moment of silence. You know, listen to everything around you, the sound of the rain, 
Maybe you feel the wind. Some of us might feel the cold. Just be present and look inward to yourself. Acknowledge yourself, your being, the sacred being that you are. And let's give thanks to ourselves for who we are, for being here. We didn't have to be here today. We chose to be here for a reason. We all come with different expectations, different hopes. We're at different places in our lives. <laughs> let's be mindful of why we brought ourselves here today. And let's give thanks for that. And of course, let's turn to the person sitting next to us and let's give thanks for them being here. Maybe they're friends of ours, maybe they're people we're not, we're not aware of yet, but they're our friends nevertheless. And uh, lastly, let's, let's gather hands if we're comfortable with that, or put a hand on someone's shoulder. Okay, wonderful. Just being aware that as we are individuals with our own intentions, we as a collective are strong in our efforts for justice and for peace. So let's just have a, a prayer, um, an acknowledgement for those who cannot be here today, for those who are facing oppression throughout the world in our own nation. And let's give thanks. Let's give thanks for Agape, for people who are mindful, contemplative. Let's give thanks for people who never give up. All right. Oh. In gratitude for this wonderful day and for all their speakers. Thank you and amen. 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 Thanks, Samantha. And thank you so much to the midwives of mystery. I love it. That, that name should sell CDs all over the place when you get them put out. So again, um, I greet you. Um, I um, have been a member in many, many ways of, of Agape since before its inception. Uh, Suzanne and Brayton and I often worship together before that. So I know that the, uh, the vision was brewing long, long ago and finally came together in community, in this wonderful, wonderful community. Many of us have come here year after year and have always been enriched by the people who've come to St. Francis Day or on other days of celebration. Um, it's a place of learning. It's a place of deep spirituality. It's an integrated place where the earth is all, the earth's beauty is all around us and the earth nourishes with the food from the gardens. And um, it's a place where one can be at peace. And that is such an important kind of thing. I remember just a week ago, um, I was up in northern New York, um, we have some acreage on a lake, and busy, busy, busy I was. Finally, I decided I was just going to sit. You know how sometimes you can get so cap caught up in all of the things that have to be done that you don't take time to do the essential kinds of things. So I spent just 20 minutes sitting at what we call the point, looking at the water looking at the sky, looking at everything. And my kind of poetic imagination started coming up with, with words and phrases. <laughs> I saw a turtle, I saw a fish, I saw the corrugated ripple of the water in front of me. And I realized how essential that was to my own being, how I need to integrate that kind of thing into my life in order to continue to do peace and justice work which is often very, you know, very unrewarding in the immediate moment, but when we look back, as we are able to look back on 32 years of agape, you see the effect and the, the burgeoning out of the ideas, the wonderful, wonderful influence that we have had on one another because of who we are. Years ago, probably at the beginning of Agape, um, I, I did a piece of calligraphy, which is right in front here, and I only brought it out to make the point, and it, was, it is the cloud of witnesses. 
which is an idea that has always um, comforted me. You know, the, um, the quote from Hebrews, um, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So today I think about, um, you know, St. Francis, Teresa of Lisieux, and Gandhi, all whose birth or death coincide with these dates. Um, their spirit is here. They are part of the cloud of witnesses. I think of Yom Kippur, which is the time of atonement. I think of the ingredient that we need in our hearts in order to move forward. We first have to repent of what we have done, and then with um, vision, go on. I think of the cloud of witnesses who sort of stood in two places. You know, they witnessed to what was going on, but they also witnessed to something deeper, some new possibilities, and they allowed that to grow in them. So now we look back and we, we see their wonderful, wonderful influence. Um, and, um, and we know that among us today, in our, our lives, are all kinds of people who represent the living cloud of witness and what a comfort it is to be surrounded by them or to be able to call on them. We have our wonderful speakers today. We have wonderful students. Thank God for the students. Thank God for the young people, all of you. Thank God for the old <laughs> ones of us who have perhaps a bit of wisdom you know, that we can share with you, but we are, we are uplifted by the hope that you carry. Um, I won't go on, but I did, did, wanted to say just one thing in terms of the, the providential, serendipitous kinds of things that happen. Um, I came today uh, with some photos of the People's Climate March, and I was there too, and I think the thing that stood out for me was um, one of the moments when um, young people around me started raising their hands. And I didn't know what they were doing. What were they doing? And I said, what are you doing? And the young woman next to me said, shh. And I got it. Put up my hands. Everybody started putting up their hands. There was absolute silence. Even the helicopter seemed to stop at that <laughs> moment in time. It rippled through the crowd, and then, after a moment of silence, what rippled through the crowd was this sound wave beginning in the front and going all the way to the back. You know, this joining, this organic mass of people into one entity. And I kept thinking, the politicians, the people in power, the corporations have got to see this. They have got to see our energy, which is contained here in this in this moment. You know, these people who are so dedicated, bringing forth new hope. And so today will be a hopeful day. Um, we have a wonderful, wonderful keynote speaker, Mary Evelyn Tucker, and her husband John Grimm, who will lead a panel. And, um, oh, so the, the serendipitous thing for today was that I took a picture. I took a picture and I showed it to Francis Crow this morning and the picture says the number one polluter, war. And she said, oh, that's Claudia. And I said, oh, who's Claudia? And a good friend of Pucky's and Francis, um, and oh, how was I to know that? You know, out of all the hundreds of thousands of people, I took a picture of someone's friend, and so she's with us. She was, a, she was one of the witnesses. We're all witnesses, and so we're going to have a wonderful day. Um, let me see now. Uh, Elle McClellan, um, a Sacred Heart nun, will introduce Mary Evelyn. And she is a long-time member of the Mission Council. She is a member of the Sister of the, Year of the Earth, which follows a Thomas Berry's spirituality of the universe. 
Um, she works with the Mass Audubon Society, and her community lives in the house in which my husband grew up in Newton Center, Massachusetts. So let me hand the microphone over to Elle, and we'll get on with the important part of the day. Thank you, Pat. I'm really thrilled to introduce Mary Evelyn. I've heard her speak a couple of times, and you are really in for a treat. Mary Evelyn um, teaches in the Joint Master's Degree Program between the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and the School of Divinity at Yale University. She also, with her husband, John Grimm, directs the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale. And it just attests to her popularity that there are several Yale students here who could hear her perfectly well at Yale, but they came all this distance to hear her again. So I think that says something. Mary Evelyn's specialty is in Asian religions. She spent several years in Japan, and she has a PhD from Columbia in Japanese Confucianism. Her friend and mentor was Father Thomas Berry, and I can't even put into words what a wonderful person he was. He was a teacher for many of us. Many of us follow his teachings about the spirituality of the earth, and he's just, he was a total inspiration for so many of us. <clears throat> and lastly, right now, Mary Evelyn and her husband John are journey, uh, traveling around showing the movie Journey of the Universe, which was 10 years in the making, and both of them, along with Brian Swim, have created this film, which is truly extraordinary. It talks about the ongoing evolution of the cosmos and the dynamic forces which have, cre which have shaped and continue to shape our universe. I hope that if you haven't seen it, you will get it because it is just a wonderful film and it has a depth of, um, it has a message <laughs> that is too deep to put into words. And so with that, I'd like to welcome Mary Evelyn. And let's have a big round of applause for Suzanne and Brayton and their team here. <laughs> And all the people on the program, of course, looking forward to hearing more, and the wonderful musicians this morning, and our musician last night. Uh, and I want to say a special welcome, of course, to our Yale students, as I did last night, and also to a very wonderful colleague, Mary Catherine Bateson. I'm so thrilled she's here, the daughter of Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson, but a scholar in her own right. and. Um, a dear friend, along with Nancy Earl and Miriam, coming from Maine. Um, I'm very grateful for their presence as well. Okay, so I just thanked everybody. Consider yourselves thanked too for coming out in the rain. Uh, you're uh, very brave, and uh, but the spirit of rain is extraordinary. I mean, it's a gift, and we need to take it in, don't we? And so many parts of our country um, are literally running out of water. Um, which is uh, something reading yesterday in the New York Times in California, literally running out of water. And it's, a, it's so disturbing, so arresting. So giving thanks for Brother Rain, as Suzanne said, we were adopted into the Crow tribe amidst one of the hugest rainstorms on the high plains, which included hail. So <laughs> we consider rain a great, great blessing. So. The theme today, as we discussed with Suzanne and Brayton, um, was how to bring together various movements in our country, in the world, of ecology, of justice, and of peace. This has been a huge center right here for peace and justice, and of course ecology. And what I want to suggest is we are seeing more and more in the climate March illustrated that so well, didn't it? How all of these causes and movements are coming together. 
and we need to bring a solidarity of these various movements together to see their integration, to see their implicit um, and explicit movements with each other. And I, I can say this from a lot of experience, I'll tell you from the beginning, from, I'll give you just a little bio of how I came into some of this, but even when we went out to teach at Bucknell, um, we had people in the religion department who were big, big social justice folks, and they were like, ecology? What? You know, they were like, is this whitewater rafting or something? And we were like, what? <laughs> you see, so, and that sensibility is still around, as we know. We have to get to unity and diversity, but in a huge sense, which is why the journey of the universe is giving us that unified vision of where, the story that we all come out of. But I want to just share with you, because we do all have our personal bios, this isn't just an abstract kind of thing, and just because I teach it at Yale, <laughs> that I'm just in my head. I'm not in my head. <laughs> I'm in my heart about these things, and with John, who I am so grateful for. Can you give a round of applause for John, too? <laughs> I'd like to say, I'd be in the funny farm without John and Thomas Berry, and that's the truth. Um, so here's the beginning of my journey. In high school, I was hugely influenced by Catholic social teaching, social justice teaching. It was a holy child school. Um, they're great nuns. They run Rosemont College and so on. Um, and there's a huge sensibility about poverty and discrimination and the Catholic worker as well of which, as I said last night, my grandparents were big, big supporters of Dorothy Day, would bring down a turkey to the Catholic worker um, every Thanksgiving and so on. So all of that was part of my formation. And then I went off to college in the 60s uh, to Trinity in Washington, D.C. And wow, things really exploded. This was the late 60s. It's where Nancy Pelosi went, and Kathleen Sebelius, and so on. And we were pretty active, I can tell you, and sitting, debating late nights. So I'm going to be down there at the Pentagon, and what's going to happen? And I had calls from ants, and so on. You shouldn't really go to these demonstrations, and whatnot. <laughs> and my parents were scratching their heads. Um, but there was this huge sense of the two big issues that were pressing in on us, of civil rights, and the anti-Vietnam War movement. And of course, these intersected in people like Martin Luther King, who saw the intersection, the militarization, and so on. Um, but the huge sense I had growing up in Washington, D.C., of the, I mean, so in New York, of the inequities. You know, I was born near Columbia and seeing Harlem and the huge inequities that race has caused in our society. And John, who studies Native traditions, this is hugely present on the Native uh, American reservations as well, which we really need to remember all the time. Anyway, so these issues of race, the issues of civil rights that were huge. We grew up in an apartheid society, didn't we? We really did. We've never really named it, but that's our history. Um, can't go to the bathroom, you can't swim in the pool, you can't go on the bus. What is this? You can't go to school? You see those young girls walking to schools? Some of them still living and telling the story of it? James Meredith integrating Mississippi University and you know death threats to him? Unbelievable stories. This is in our lifetime, which is also good why Francis said last night, certain things have changed. We have a long way to go, but we do have to breathe into the fact that a lot of things have changed. So, I mean, the Poor People's March in Washington, people all up and down the mall for these issues of civil rights and so on. Um, it was an electrifying time, needless to say. Um, but the sense then, you know, going from the McCarthy campaign, Gene McCarthy working hard for him, I worked in Muskie's office um, as a student. I worked on the McGovern campaign. And after the McGovern campaign and Nixon winning, <laughs> because we even knew it in the New York office for McGovern at that time, our phones were being tapped. You know, there was all kinds of stuff going on at that time. 
And so my disillusionment was great. Anybody else been disillusioned about politics? <laughs> Join the party, right? Um, but it was so great, it was so fundamental, that um, I had this opportunity to go teach in Japan at a Catholic woman's college there related to Trinity, and I said, I'm going. I have to get out of the country. I said, I'm going out until Nixon is out of office. And it was about two years later when I get um, out on the subway station in Tokyo. I'd been at a Zen retreat for about a week. And all of a sudden I look at the newspaper and it says, Nixon resigns. And I said, I can go home again. <laughs> um, and so that sense, though, of trying to find my way back into meaning, purpose, depth, unity, diversity, a story that made sense. We've all had our, our lineages this way. Um, and so being out of the country two times was a great sense of relief. I spent my sophomore year in, in England, and even though it was 68, 69, <clears throat> it was a relief to get away from the Washington uh, hyper atmosphere. And then going in the early 70s to Japan for two years, um, was also very important, even though I went to Vietnam um, in 74, just a few months before it fell, and it was unbelievable. I mean, you could fly over and see the fields destroyed by Agent Orange, uh, being in Saigon uh, with an orphanage where our friends were working. You could see the results of the war and so on. Um, but I also have to say that Coming out of war, I'm not saying war is at all positive, um, but we now do have relations with Vietnam. The Second World War, our parents would call the Japanese Japs, right? We now have some of the most robust Asian studies in the world, okay? Um, out of some of these conflicts and tragedies have come a greater understanding of people and cultures and so on, which is, of course, what we're hoping for with the Islamic world, which is going to take a long, long time, a long time. Um, but let me say, then, that being in, in Japan during those years, the war still going on in Vietnam, the 60s still in upheaval here in, in the States, um, I did open up to three things that changed my life, and I'm sure you've also experienced some of these as well. One was Asian religions, Buddhism. I did a lot of Zen meditation. Um, was profoundly moved by the Zen gardens in Kyoto, and that sense of being part of a presence of the rocks, the moss, the pine trees, the silence. Being there one time in December, in Kyoto, very quiet, no people in this Zen garden. And all of a sudden, it began to snow, and it was magic. Wow. You know, this sense, where does this come from? This great mystery of water in the universe and so on. That's what a Zen garden can do for us. You know, slow us down, bring us into touch with this great, extraordinary complexity and beauty. So, these traditions opened me up to a really cosmic sensibility that we're part of a great mystery. We're part of a living, breathing earth and universe. And the other thing that I began to do was reading Teilhard more, Teilhard de Chardin. How many are Teilhard fans here? Right, see? We're in our tribe, aren't we? <laughs> Well, John's president of the Teilhard Association, and I'm his vice <laughs> president. And, you know, Thomas Berry was president before us, and we've been keeping this small organization. Come join us, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, the Teilhard's vision, and especially with the upheaval of the 60s, gave me this huge, deep time perspective. We can breathe into these amazing unfolding of a universe, an earth, life. I mean, it took a billion years for the first cell to emerge. Can you imagine? I mean, wow. The profound sense of awe, wonder, gratitude, and praise that really comes through in that sense of depth. The Teilhard gave 
perspective. I could breathe again. And that was put together by Thomas Berry, right? So Thomas Berry, so I wrote him when I was in Japan because I wanted to get his book on Buddhism. And I had some of his papers before I went to Japan. And I was reading them before I went and I didn't get them fully, but I got to Japan and I sensed these Asian traditions and I sensed his feeling of the Asian traditions opening to the cosmos, but the West also had something to say. He was very balanced. I was like, wow, this is really a mind and heart of extraordinary capacity. So I wrote him um, to see if I could get his book, and the miracle of my life is he wrote back. <laughs> Remember when we wrote letters? <laughs> Don't forget to write your grandchildren a letter or two. Um, anyway, he wrote back. And needless to say, when I got back from Japan, met him, it was February 2nd, the fe Feast of the Blessing of the Throats. Remember that? <laughs> I met him. I remember everything about the day, a luminous winter day. Remember what he was wearing, what I was wearing, the Hudson River, the Palisades behind. <laughs> Extraordinary. And that meeting of a person who himself had gone to China in 48, 49 to study these Asian religions, especially Confucianism and Buddhism and so on. He wrote a book on the religions of India too. It's still in print. So he educated John and me in the world's religions with immense appreciation for their mystical dimensions, for their historical unfolding, for their complexity, that they are not static, but in process and constantly changing which gave us the hope that we could urge them, midwife them into dialogue with the great issues of our time, especially ecology and justice and peace, which is why we've done this series at Orbis on ecology and justice. There's about 20 books in that series, trying to bridge the gap there. So Thomas had this immense feelings for the world's religions, 10,000 books in his library at Riverdale. We would gather for over a dozen years, once a month, have these conversations, potlucks. Extraordinary. And it's what you're doing here to create community as well, which is indispensable, as we were speaking last night, to a community with a vision, a community that keeps hope alive in difficult times. That is what we are all about. And it's so important to keep that hope alive, especially for the next generations. So Thomas brought the world religions into focus, but he also brought evolutionary time, right? Deep time into the sense of story. So I met him in 75. Three years later, 78, he wrote the new story. One article that has shaped and reshaped our thinking of this need for a story the sense, how can we put ourselves back into deep time, the unfolding of the universe, and how does it pass through us and give us that energy that we align with these processes? That is what will sustain us, the aligning with these unfolding, dynamic, energizing processes of galaxy formations, of, of planetary formations, of life formations, of human society formations. So this notion that we are biocultural beings, not just cultural beings, but we're biologically constructed from all of this, from stars and so on, right down to the present, it changes everything, doesn't it? I see yes back there. <laughs> um, you know, we can't say it enough. We cannot say it enough because here's the challenge for our times. How do we become cosmological beings, biological beings, and cultural beings as a unified concentric circles, right? The cosmos, the earth, and the humans. That's our challenge, which is what religions helped to do earlier, right? The microcosm, the macrocosm, this resonating presence, and so on. And as John will do this afternoon with St. Francis and the Canticle of the Cosmos, we have it in our traditions. The canticle of the cosmos is the greatest praise we can possibly offer, right? Sun, moon, stars, and so on. So 
this sense then of returning to Fordham to study with Thomas Berry, the transforming vision that he had, meeting John there, who was also a graduate student, did his work on shamanism and Native American traditions and so on. Um, but I could see, and this is what we have to remember, the struggle for this unifying vision with Thomas, the struggle for articulating something. You remember he used to have this cough, <coughs> you know, and he'd be like, ah! and it was part of how do we articulate what's coming through us in these forces. We're all trying to articulate. I used to say women's liberation is artic articulation. Right? This little baby's trying to articulate something. <laughs> and we're all trying to speak our words, like the, conver the questions and conversations last night. We need to speak our words in relation to, in resonance with, these great processes that surround us and give us guidance. Um, so, the new story, universe story, in the book, 92, with Thomas and Brian, in the film now, the first time it's been told in a film, one telling of a story, it'll be told in many different ways. But it is something to overcome the fragmentation. It is an offering of healing for the planet and its people and its species, an antidote to the fragmentation of our times, to the immense sense that things are breaking down, and we know it. The economic system certainly is breaking down. 2008 is a perfect example. If you don't include the externalities of the environment in your cost accounting, things are going to break down, and they are. The political system, let's not even talk about it. <laughs> it's so broken. The educational system, those of you involved in teaching, oh my gosh, what we're all up against. And I think some of the heroes of our times are the teachers from K through 12. Yeah. Let's give it up for them. K through 12, unbelievable. And you think of the inner city K through 12 teachers, unbelievable. We at universities are very blessed. <laughs> I mean, you get my picture. <laughs> um, but this sense then of coming into our cosmological being, coming into our cosmic self that's grounded in the earth is one of the great challenges of bringing together ecology and justice and peace. Um, because we are motivated fundamentally by story. That's what we like to do. We tell our stories to them. Where are you from? What are you doing? Well, your children and so on. Um, so this sense of the story that motivates the great work, as Thomas would say, the great work that every person can contribute to. The feeling of disempowerment is immense, isn't it? Anybody feel disempowered? <laughs> All the time, right? You listen to the news, what can I do? But this story gives us, a, shifts that sense. It doesn't take it away fully, because the, the challenges are immense. But what Thomas was trying to say is like building a cathedral. One person's carrying a stone, another's the mason, and all of a sudden something emerges that's a great story, a great work. The, as I said last night, the inspiration for the perspiration on the ground. The changes in farming, in agriculture, in economics, in energy, in education, they are happening and we need to identify them and lift them up, to lift them up, which we do in the conversations of the journey of the universe. So, this sense then that the epic story of evolution is one of the ways we can weave together ecology, justice, and peace. And this is one of the most important things we can do, especially those who've been holding up the social justice and peace and nonviolence, as you have been here and at other Catholic worker communities and other uh, Pax Christi and so on. These movements are alive and we need to unite, don't we, with our friends in different movements and consciously nurture 
yeast, this conversation. It's a yeasting. We have to make bread. We have to watch it rise and feel that energy and not feel disempowered. So because we are on the edge and we feel it in our bones, it takes away our energy. People are deeply depressed and sad. We feel the destruction of our times. We have to speak that. We have to recognize it, acknowledge it, mourn it, lament it, sing it, ritualize it, and move towards creativity as well. We have this in our traditions to mourn loss and destruction and sorrow and death and move towards creativity. We have to see these as a yin and a yang and not get stuck on the destructive and sad side of things. Our hearts can still praise the beauty of creation. It can still sing that beauty and bring it alive in us. And that is an unstoppable, renewable energy, that spiritual energy for change, isn't it? <clears throat> so this sense then that we cannot afford to have divisions between ecology and human interests, that we are biocultural beings, that social justice and climate justice are the same thing. And that's what that march was so much about, all the issues coming together, as Pat said. But climate justice is one thing that exemplifies who is being hurt the most. The poor, the oppressed, the people most vulnerable on, on the edge of rising seas in the South, Pacific, they're already moving people from Tuvalu and these island countries, the Maldives, uh, in the Indian Ocean, and so on. These are vulnerable people. The floods in Pakistan and Kashmir, just in September, millions of people affected by this, barely in our newspapers, but millions of people being affected around the world and in our own country. Katrina is a scar on our national memory. And so is Sandy. And so is Sandy. And that means southern Manhattan floods. My brother works in Chubb Insurance. Couldn't get into the office building for six months. I mean, it's staggering. Everybody is affected, right? Climate justice brings us together with ecology and justice issues and peace and democracy and nonviolence. We've got to build the institutions, democratic institutions. Look what's happening in Hong Kong. This is extraordinary, isn't it? 17 and 18 year old students leading this. Unbelievable. It just as the, the Arab Spring was led by very, very young people around the world. Um, so let us think feel, experience, and experiment with how we consciously bring these groups together. And I want to say one more thing before I turn to the Earth Charter about the democracy and the nonviolence and the peace. And that is, um, Pat is here and Ray is here and I see Chris Lachlan here. Um, people who have been working in this area of nuclear weapons, right? Nuclear weapons. Go back and look at last Monday's New York Times, oh, yeah. the nuclear story right where Megan Rice is mentioned. Yes. Yeah. Megan Rice, how many of you know Megan, about Megan? Okay, Megan Rice, a holy child nun, the order that influenced me greatly. Her parents and my grandparents were good friends Megan Rice, an 85-year-old nun, did a nonviolent peace protest action in Oak Ridge called Y-12. Anytime I've asked people, they have no idea what Y-12 is. It's the largest uranium enrichment plant on the planet in Tennessee. She and two other Catholic worker men did this peaceful protest. She's in jail for three years. They're in jail for five. 
But this article in the New York Times says why it's so important that we keep alive this peace movement across the board. Um, extraordinary. The expense alone of a trillion dollar military budget and then more budgets for nuclear refurbishment, uh, fixing up these plants and so on and so forth. We have to link these up. That's the point. War too is one of the greatest environmental degradations on the planet. And the, the places, Rocky Mountain Flats and so on, many of these uh, institutions of war have environmental uh, pollution all around. Okay, I'm saying the obvious then, aren't I? Ecology, justice, and peace. But we've got to really do it. We've got to really do it. We've kind of known it up here. So, what I want to kind of move towards in the final part of, of my talk, I could have made the whole talk this, um, is the Earth Charter. Does this? How many of you know the Earth Charter? Oh, man. Good. So, some do, some don't, and I hope everyone has a copy. There's more there as you, as you leave. So the Earth Charter is a document we can draw on to weave these together. It came out of the 92 Earth Summit in Rio, United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, trying to figure out how can you have environmental protection and development for people in the developing world, okay? This has been our major problem in the last few decades, environment and development. Um, they just had the Rio Plus 20 conference, so we're just 20 years past Rio. And one of the things we do have to remember is that's a very short period of time, but a lot has happened. Now, just like our film took 10 years, this took 10 years also. The Earth Charter, came out of the Rio conference because Gorbachev, who was chairing it, along with Maurice Strong, a Canadian businessman, said, we need a global ethics to guide environment and development and democracy and peace and so on. We need a charter for the earth for bringing together ecology and justice and peace. And the other lines there are saying, why is ecology put first here. And by the way, in many of the Christian documents, the WCC, World Council of Churches and so on, it's been peace, justice, and the integrity of creation, right? Notice, this is reversed. Why? <coughs> Why? Why do we have ecological integrity first? Because if the ecosystems go down, everything goes down. <laughs> you know, bio, biology 101. It's so what's happening in California with the water. With the water. It is incredible. We could do a dance here because we have water on the East Coast, right? But the, to protect and preserve the biological systems of the planet is the giving of the human to resilience, to restoration, to alignment with these processes. And we have got to figure out, and that's why the ecological sciences, the biological sciences are crucial. We've got to figure out how can we restore wetlands and forests and devastated parts of our planet. We're never going to fix them to be pristine, but we've got to be in alignment with the life processes, you see? This is a great work. This is an exciting work. And it's why young people who get the training and the knowledge and can bring it forward are indispensable, all of us indispensable to the work. Growing gardens, organic, all of that is keeping living systems going, eating living systems. Why food is a huge issue for young people. It's fabulous. We just had a conference at Yale, 300 people nourishing New Haven, not just about organics for us as privileged people, but what does it mean for inner city people in New Haven and the desert uh, food systems and so on. It's fantastic what the young people are doing about food and seeing it as integrated into the bio systems. Okay, the sense then of justice um, the sense that poverty, inequity, 
which we know is so destructive to our society and around the world. How can we have systems of such inequity? And I have been at international conferences in Europe and many parts of the world, and people cannot believe we're standing in Mississippi with the Greek Orthodox Patriarch, who's one of the great spokespersons for ecology and justice and peace. We're standing at one of these plants that are polluting petroleum plants with African-American communities right there in the waves of the pollution and the sickness and so on. And these Europeans are looking at us like, this is America? They cannot believe it. They cannot believe it. But all of this environmental justice, you see, brings together the ecology and justice um, issues over and over again. Um, I had all kinds of things underlined to talk about, but I think we should get into discussion. So, But I do want to say the other thing in the justice section are gender equality. Can we give it up for women right now? <laughs> right now. I mean, seriously. Who has kept alive so many of these movements? And anyway, I'm not going to get into all these issues, but if we empower women, if we give them voices, and I can tell you, as an academic woman, the first one to be tenured in religion at Bucknell. No, but it's not, it's not about me. It's about saying, if it wasn't for John and Thomas Berry, I couldn't have survived this academic system. I could not have survived it. It was so brutal. Of 12 people at Columbia when I was a graduate student, I was the first one to graduate after eight years, and only two people graduated after that. It is a really brutal system, I can tell you. And tenure is one of the worst parts of it. But we've got to empower women, not just in academia, in every field. We have to empower women. And I'm saying this only by way of saying, it's scary, it's nerve-wracking, it's heartbreaking, but we have to find our voices. Women of the world, unite. <laughs> um, and the other thing here in the justice section is about indigenous peoples. Yeah and the rights of indigenous peoples to their culture, to their land, and so on. It's so powerful in this document, absolutely. And John, who has worked with native peoples for 30 years now, um, the degradation on our reservations is not to be believed. The poorest parts of our country are the reservations, and the abuse and so on that goes on is not to be believed, and yet, We've been to many, many Sundances. John has danced in the Sundance nine times. I think it's given us huge energy for our work, that sacrificial sense, no food, no water for three days, that they have kept alive rituals of that dimension on the high plains is against every eye. If they can do it, we can do it, definitely. So finally, ecology, justice, and peace. Now the peace section, I feel this community knows so well that I should almost not speak because you have devoted your lives to that sensibility of peacemaking, peace giving, peace being. It is an extraordinary gift, I think, that you have given to not only New England, but to the world. And what I want to underscore is in the drafting it was by way of saying peace needs democracy. It needs democratic institutions to support ecology and justice and peace. So we've got to work for democracy. We've got to work for the strengthening of the UN and so on and so forth that's in this document too. But most especially, and again I want to just lift it up because it's what your community has lifted up, that from India there was a woman Kamala Chowdhury on the drafting committee who insisted with no resistance that nonviolence be on the same level, peace, democracy, and nonviolence. And that was the powerful legacy of Gandhi in this document. So that if we can live, and I try and work this out <laughs> um, myself, if we can live with a sense of a presence to people, to the world, 
that is peaceful within us, the sense that Thomas Berry would have the communion of subjects, the living interdependent world, the interbeing that Thich Nhat Hanh speaks of as well. So I want to conclude ecology, justice, and peace, but with a profound sense of the gift of this community to hold up for so many years nonviolence in our midst. So as we conclude, let's applaud Agate and Suzanne and Brave. So I think we had some response and then some dialogue. Just, just a couple of words um, from me before I um, introduce Frida, who will do the responses. Um, you know, it, it's just absolutely remarkable, um, the, um, the experience of listening to such dire, hopeful, um, energizing um, talks such as um, Mary Evelyn has given us. Um, my heart is so alive not only with the, um, the story of how badly we've done in many, many ways, but also my heart is alive with the hope that, um, that, that this communal spirit, the energy that we put forth, really can begin to, to heal things, you know, that we can work together. Um, it's, uh, I, I just love some of the expressions used, that idea of deep time, you know, and um, the earth being alive, and we're a part of it, and we have so much to do, but it, the other thing would be naming the issues, how important that is. You've got to name the problem, and I think that, you know, the cloud of witnesses did that kind of thing, too. They, they stood on, they straddled both, you know, and um, which brings me... And, and so thank you very, very much for what you've done for us, and it is a beginning, and for introducing the Earth Charter to um, those of us who know a little bit, but not enough. And it's, a, it's, it's something to go with, absolutely. And um, speaking of naming the issues and putting your voice out there and women and all of this sort of thing, Rita Berrigan is here, and uh, she is, of course, the daughter of uh, Phil Berrigan and Liz McAllister. And I didn't know Frida, except I came across something she had written years ago when um, she and a group of activists, peacemakers, walked to, tried to walk to Guantanamo, where so many people were being held after 9-11. And she wrote a short but profound piece, which made me want to know more about Witness Against Torture, which was the group that she represented. And um, I did. And her words, just that, that, uh, that beautiful little essay, brought me to Washington um, twice to fast with the Witness Against Torture. It um, made it possible for my whole parish over a year's time to write to every single Guantanamo prisoner. And now it's an ongoing effort. And um, uh, we, uh, many of us fast on Fridays on behalf and do some actions. So the power is, is there in all of us and all of it takes sometimes is just a word or something written or some wonderful new ideas that are introduced into our lives that make all the difference in the world. So Frida's going to give a few responses um, to Mary Evelyn and, um, and then we'll have questions and answers. Um, so I like to think of myself as sort of um, unencumbered by objects, you know, like I don't have a lot of special objects. But there is this one special object, which is um, an ergo carrier, which uh, makes babies happy. Um, all the time they're nice and warm and close to you and you have your hands free and they never cry uh, when they're in ergo carriers and I forgot ours today. So, um, uh, so Joanne, uh, my mother-in-law is with the um, crabby baby who really wants to fall asleep and can't quite get it without uh, her, without the ergo. Anyway, so um, I'm uh, supposed to resonate um, and I was uh, hoping to be able to take a lot of notes and um, write down all of the profound things that Mary Evelyn said. And of course, I just kind of jostled this 
crabby baby the whole time. But um, uh, but luckily Francis is here, Francis Crow. Um, and one of the things that uh, um, I pulled out from what Mary Evelyn said is is this idea of of time and of generations. Um, and I was profoundly graced um, to uh, uh, go to college here in the Pioneer Valley at Hampshire College. And I spent my first semester there cleaning the toilets um, of the library. That was my work study job. Um, and then that was not very much fun. And, um, and so I found out that uh, the American Friends Service Committee in Northampton, just down the road, was, um, you know, would take work study students. And I was able to work with Francis uh, the whole rest of my time at college. I would take the bus into Northampton and work in her basement office and learned how to do all of that nitty gritty stuff of, of the work of peacemaking, making telephone calls and filing and um, drafting press releases and typing up notes and all of that kind of stuff. And, um, and we would sit and eat hummus and, uh, um, uh, carrot sticks together, and I would always leave really hungry, even though we had eaten <laughs> Francis's lunch, and uh, cottage cheese, we would eat cottage cheese, and, um, and so I learned a lot of, of stuff there, but I also, you know, all that nitty gritty stuff, but I also learned the importance of just kind of carrying on, and, um, and continuing uh, to do uh, the work, kind of through thick and thin, and I think most of the time I was in college, it was kind of a thin time in the sense of like, peace movement was sort of like on a little bit of a vacation, you know, for, for most of that time. And then didn't really kind of come back until after 9-11 in, in, a, in a kind of large way. Um, and, uh, and so um, living in New York City uh, from 98 to 2009, being sort of part of the peace movement in uh, New York City after 9-11 through the War Resisters League, I really was able to draw back on uh, the lessons uh, learned at uh, Francis's side. And, um, uh, and Francis is a lot shorter than I am, but I definitely like have always looked up um, to her and I'm so happy to see her again. Um, but a couple words are stuck out um, from the presentation, the um, patience. Uh, and that is such a countercultural concept um, that we need to be patient. Um, and from what Pat said in her introduction, that sitting and taking time, time that uh, is not about any project or goal um, or checking something off the to-do list, but, but time, um, Time to admire, time to reflect, time to praise. Uh, that was another uh, word that I heard really loud and clear uh, from the presentation, praise. Um, patience, praise, margin. Um, we are in the margin, right? We are the margin. Um, and I don't know if it was, I, I, I want to attribute this to Vandana Shiva, but um, it could be somebody else who talked about the, um, the importance of the margin in uh, in sustainable agriculture, that 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 there needs to be a margin around uh, of, around crops, um, and that protects um, uh, crops. That um, is a place of dynamism, a place of hybridization, um, a place where uh, new things happen. Um, that the margin is a very rich place. Uh, it's not a place to be weed whacked. It's not a place to be sprayed. It's a place to um, to build up, um, and uh, and I think we can find a lot of dynamism, a lot of alchemy, a lot of hybridization um, in in the margin. That's where the intersections happen, right? Like that's where the that's where ecology and peace and nonviolence and um, all of these issues need to intersect. They intersect in the margin, and they intersect in relationships between people. Um, and I think that's another thing I definitely learned from Francis Crow is, um, is relating to each person, to seeing each person, um, to not be intimidated by people's high stations um, and not be kind of writing um, uh, lower people off. Um, and maybe I'll just, well, no, I, I, maybe you guys all know that story, so I won't tell it, and I know we're running late on time. But um, so those, those different words, and I, I, I think we'll keep coming back to those words throughout our day together. 
patience, margin, intersection, um, relationship. Um, and I'm really grateful uh, uh, for the presentation um, and grateful for each uh, person's presence here. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, um, kind of in comparison to the Arab Spring and the uprisings in Hong Kong, um, where have you seen the same opportunities in the United States for youth and people in their early 20s to um, support new social justice movements? Where have you seen it and where is there more space for it in your mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We need to describe these movements in broad ways because they're not just social justice, you see. The Arab Spring began because uh, of the price of bread going up and the effect of ecology in the Middle East. Syria is a result of a drought, you know, and an upheaval of two million people. And Tom Friedman is beginning to write about this. I mean, the Middle East is a ecological disaster. I mean, we were in Iran in 2001 and 2005, and Hatami said, uh, the rivers had run dry in Isfahan, and so on. Hatami, the president then said, we're more concerned about the environment than terrorism, you see? So, my, what I'm trying to say here is the Arab Spring, um, Hong Kong is definitely a democracy issue, and so on, but uh, we were just in China in August. I mean, the environment is why we began these conferences at Harvard on religion and ecology. There are 100,000 protests a year in China alone around environmental issues. You cannot breathe in Beijing, in Shanghai, but in the countryside as well. People are suffering the environment. It's, it's beyond comprehension. It's really beyond comprehension. And the same in India. You know, when a billion people in each of these countries are yearning for modernity, and the fruits of, of a Western lifestyle. Anyway, we talk about inequities and the consequences. It's enormous. But your question specifically is what can young people do in this country, which I really... Yeah, well, I mean, I think Occupy was a huge example of that, right? Huge example of that. Um, and, you know, how movements both get started and the legacy of that movement is the 1%, right? Everybody knows what that is. I mean, mi movements may need more leadership and direction. Even That was a very, very democratic movement, and that is pros and cons of that, right? Um, but we do need, we need articulation of ideas. And Occupy, even though I supported it enormously, I feel we had to lift up what are the issues, you see? And we have to join these things together. Anyway, Occupy is one, but there are a hundred thousand groups in this country, NGOs and so on, that are dying for the energy of young people, including Teach for America and so on and so forth. So I think there's a lot to be done. The question is we have to support your generation and give an intergenerational handshake and make sure you can support yourself. You know, that's, these are huge issues. But I do think the opportunities are emerging and the, the quest for leadership is, is really great. And we have got to open up the space for your creativity and your ideas and your leadership. Um, I think that's hugely important. Thank you for your question. <laughs> Uh, my question is uh, the whole issue of overpopulation and as a result of this um, species are being crowded out uh, and uh, we just heard that maybe 50% of the species is being lost today. What is your response to how this could be uh, 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 taken care of in some way uh, where, where there could be a balance mm -hmm. of species and, and human uh, so that the human can live on a, a more natural level. Yeah. You know, with climate change, we lose sight of the fact that we are in a sixth extinction period. Um, the other one's being caused by massive climate change or an asteroid and so on, but in 65 million years since the dinosaurs were wiped out by an asteroid on the Yucatan Peninsula, there's never been such devastation of species. And World Wildlife Fund just announced the loss of species on such a huge level. 
where are the religious communities on this issue? This is life. It's incredible to me. Biodiversity is what gives culture life, too. It's unbelievable. Respect for life? Please. It's not just human life. It is all life and all species. So that sense that we live with a communion of subjects, that's what Thomas kept saying, a communion of subjects. These are living, breathing creatures speaking to us all the time. So your question, um, and, and by the way, we're shutting down the Cenozoic era. That's what Thomas had said, and we're trying to create the foundations for the Ecozoic era, a new foundation for humans. It's bigger than the Anthropocene, because that's a 10,000 year Holocene period, 10, 12,000 years, but a 65 million year geological era. We've got to take it in on that scale. We have to take it in on a huge scale. But so your question on population, I think is hugely, hugely important. You know, the UN Population Fund, though, had no idea that the trends, that we weren't growing quite as fast as we thought, and why? Because women were being educated and empowered and finding jobs and the way to compose a life out of all the constituent parts, complex parts of a life, of children and, you know, Frida and, <laughs> and so on, the juggling met the things that we're doing. But so empowerment of women, education of women is hugely important. But to me, that also means what is nurturing? How can we nurture this next generation? We do not have children, but our students are our children. We need to nurture the, the, the children of the next generation in so many ways. And that is something we all need, both men and women. How do we nurture on a much vaster scale. Um, I think the religions, you know, it's, it's the Catholic tradition and Islam that has been uh, a problem in the UN uh, negotiations on, on uh, population issues. The other world religions are not, not bothered by population control. So we, we have to really understand that. They're, you know, Confucians, Buddhists, uh, Hindus, and so on. Um, but we have to recognize what, what is dignity? What are the conditions for reproductive health, which is in the Earth Charter, too? How do we really contribute to the flourishing of life, which takes into consideration the conditions and limits of a planet? And why, when the Chinese tried to control population, you know, was there such an uprising? It's an imperfect system, but we've got to find ways to do this. Um, more consciously and carefully and respectfully. So, and the justice population. Well, yes, and as John is saying, a first world family, um, you know, will take up more resources and a child than in the developing world. So we have to, we always connect, and the Earth Charter does, <clears throat> population and justice issues, uh, population and consumption issues. So thank you, John, for that. With them, and they have conferences in the summer where they bring teachers from all over the United States together in small groups to nurture them. And she's very opposed for Teach for America because she said you, it throws young people not prepared into a classroom. They don't know what to do. They've had no training. And they leave. And they, they're disillusioned. They don't stay in education. And I think one model for young people is AmeriCorps. And I have a granddaughter who's head of AmeriCorps in the West. And they do great work, you know, through nonprofit organizations. And I think those are the models that we should be investigating and holding up for young people. And the other thing that I have learned uh, as an elder is uh, from uh, Paki, and that when you look at a, a situation, she always asks the question, who benefits? And when we look for, you know, in education, the AmeriCorps uh, doesn't benefit. 
uh, they're paid very poorly and they don't work for the corporations, whereas Teach for America is often tied in with the corporations and the wars. Who benefits from the wars? Well, the globe, the, uh, we know the armaments industry uh, only, not the people involved. Thank you. I think at the same time that we emphasize how important it is to get young people involved, we also emphasize that for the first time really in history, we have large numbers of older adults in good health and full of energy and that we should invite all older adults to work for the future in which they would like future generations to grow up in the beautiful world that we have grown up. The demographic changes in this country, from people living longer and healthier, create obviously some problems. Um, but they re represent a major opportunity. And this is what I think we have to say. We have to say to people in their 70s and 80s to step up and protect this beautiful world for the future. What I have also seen there and what I feel is happening in other uh, academic institutions is a neglect of the humanities. Too often, it seems, all of the money is going into the sciences, and I know, I know we have to compete in the world, but don't we have to learn to live in the world first? I'd just like to follow up a little bit on what um, Francis Crow said. I work um, in environmental education for the Mass Audubon Society, and we have children outside studying the birds, the bees, the, they work on a farm, we have an ecological farm. And one of the things we do is to try to have even five minutes of silence during the class, have the kids lie on their backs and look at the, look at the clouds, see what they see, or have them um, take, uh, we have a whole box of seeds, have them look at pine cones and different kinds of seeds and just think about it, really look, see what they see. And we also have a program whereby we're educating public school teachers who come to Drumlin Farm and learn how to do this outdoor kind of education. And I just think that's a, a good follow-up on Francis's remarks and that that is going on and that is the hope for the future. Thank you. I think that's terrific. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to pick up on, on your comment. Um, so humanities are crucial to the educational system that puts together ecology, justice, and peace. But in particular, I just want to underscore, one of the things we're trying to do at Yale is bring environmental humanities to the fore. And that means English, history, literature, <laughs> the arts, music, and so on. And we had a student last uh, year who uh, surveyed the courses at Yale in environmental humanities, 62 courses, which includes courses on Africa, on Asia, Latin America, and so on. Fantastic. Yale has a great strength in the humanities. Our dean at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, big believer in, of course, the outdoor education that Eleanor has just talked about too, but also feels, he's a scientist, he was head of Kew Botanical Gardens, and but he feels without the humanities, we can't make these changes, you see. And it's why the, the religion and ecology is welcomed in a science-based a school. It's, it's astonishing, you see. We're kind of like barnacles on a very big <laughs> ship. <laughs> Seriously, we are barnacles. But, but we, we're, we're within this framework that says values, culture, philosophy, religion, etc. matters to make the changes. So thank you for that comment and, and the following one. I'm just going to conclude with the final line of the Earth Charter. But one thing I wanted to bring forward is one of the things we worked on the hardest was how do we say that there's urgency in our times 
but there's also possibility. How do we speak to the peril and the promise? The hellish conditions and the hope, all right? It's that kind of juggling, that yin-yang, the destructive and creative, uh, the edges of things, as another speaker mentioned. And that sense that the choice is ours is in this uh, document. But here are the last lines, which I think reflect the sense of urgency and hope um, that's here today too. Let ours be a time remembered for the awakening of a new reverence for life, the firm resolve to achieve sustainability, the quickening of the struggle for justice and peace, and the joyful celebration of life. Let's give it up for joy and for our musicians. There's one thing I had written out. I found this uh, uh, recently, and um, you know, it, it's not a, exactly a blessing on the meal, blessing on what's to come. But I thought these words were good. And Catherine, you might even recognize them because they were written by your mother. And um, I thought it's rather fitting for all that we're doing today. And it says, um, "Prayer does not use up artificial energy. Doesn't burn up fossil fuel." doesn't pollute, neither does song, neither does love, neither does the dance, and that was by Margaret Mead. So, um, I'm, Skip is going to say a couple of words, Skip Shields, uh, about his exhibit and something else. My name is Skip Shield. I'm known to some of you as a photographer and teacher. I brought a set of photographs about Gaza, most of them made in 2013 and they're in the chapel in the far end of Francis House. Martin Luther King said, and this is not widely quoted because I think it scares some people, those who have nothing they're willing to die for are not fit to live. And I can't think of a better example of somebody who lives that way than David Hartsaw who is sitting right over here. David has been active since 1956, I believe, when he met Martin Luther King. He's been to Israel-Palestine, uh, including Gaza, I think, I forget, um, Iran, uh, Vietnam, and uh, most dramatically, he was with Brian Wilson on the tracks at the Concord Weapons Station. And when Brian uh, was run over by a train carrying munitions on their way to Vietnam, and David was right next to him holding his head trying to stop the bleeding. But he had risked his life also as Brian had to stop those trains. So I'm simply introducing uh, David, who's not going to speak now. He has come with his new book, just published, Waging Peace. And it's a story of him, but as important, uh, it is a, a model of acting in ways that can bring change and that risk one's own life. Hi there. Uh, another thing to do here, and that is uh, for those who um, we have a full lunchtime program that doesn't include eating, but you can eat. <laughs> you certainly do have some lunch. Uh, if people want to uh, tour of the Strawberry House and some alternative energy, uh, facts and figures about how to live alternatively. In 10 minutes, we will gather down by the uh, Straw Bale House for all those who wish to do that. And we'll take an hour or so for lunch. And we'll share a song with you before lunch. Um, and uh, just a quick, quick story. Um, so I, I made the mistake of not feeling like I was a, a midwife, so Brittany's been calling me Dr. Dude. Uh, so I don't know, we can try that, I don't know. But uh, I am a physician and I, I find that, that music sometimes is more healing than the medicines I prescribe. And so one of the things I do is write songs. And this song actually came about a few years ago when um, I was driving here and I got lost. And so not only was I you know, physically lost. I was also kind of in a spiritual place of questioning and so on. And so these words came out, and I wrote them down, thankfully, but then I put them aside. And then thinking about the music for this weekend, 
I was like, whatever happened to that little ditty I wrote a few years ago? And I fortunately found it and um, put a few chords to it and have taught these guys the song. And I think it's, it's very appropriate because for me, it's, you know, an invitation to, you know, invite myself and perhaps invite all of us into that space and place of you know, deeper purpose that we have, you know, to appreciate this cosmic reality and cosmic beauty we've been uh, talking about this morning. So, here we go. My book the other day, She Who Is by Elizabeth Johnson. You know, she's not in good graces with the powers that be within the Catholic Church. And I came across this quote and I thought, well, this is so perfect, you know, walking the road, the interrelatedness of everything. So just quickly um, read it to you. Creation is not a one time event, an act that produces the world and then departs. In this sense, the creator spirit is as far as possible from the distant, detached God envisioned in the, by Enlightenment, deism. Rather, her creative activity involves a continuous energizing, an ongoing sustaining of the world throughout the broad sweep of history. She is the giver of life and lover of life, <coughs> pervading the cosmos and all of its interrelated creatures with life. I mean, isn't that just perfect for, for today? Um, this afternoon we have a, um, a wonderful panel, and 
who is going, which is going to be led by um, John Grimm, and um, I was just going to give you the names of the people on the panel, and then Patrick will um, will introduce John. And it's Frida, whom we heard a few words from this morning. Ben Thompson, who is a graduate student at Boston University studying mathematics. Um, and he, he, probably everyone will talk about themselves a little bit, and then Patrick Cage and John. So I'll call on Patrick now to come forth and do his thing. Just before Patrick speaks, uh, I know from previous years with rain, the body heat is more uh, comforting if you all come closer and sit together and even hug each other. So if, I'm serious, if you could all come up, those of you who are in bed, come up and sit next to somebody. The body heat warmth factor is really good. And we have lots of, um, uh, what do you call these things? Shawls. Shawls. And, uh, so if, if people could please come up, I really mean it. If you would sit next to each other, you'd be surprised uh, how comforting that is to be close to another person. And we're, and um, these are the chairs for the panelists. So if Frida, uh, Ben Thompson, uh, Patrick, and um, we'll all be up here. And I don't know if Ben is here. Is Ben here? Hi, um, my name is Patrick Cage. I'm a current senior undergraduate at Yale College, majoring in environmental studies um, and concentrating in religion and ecology. Uh, so I owe a lot to Mary Evelyn and John because Yale College is more or less the only place you can actually study religion and ecology in the depth that I've been able to study it there. Um, so uh, during Mary Evelyn's speech earlier today, especially, we heard a lot about um, John's biography and uh, his work with indigenous peoples, especially the Crow people. So I'm just going to talk about John for a moment um, in the capacity in which I know him, which is as a teacher and as a senior advisor. Um, I first, uh, well, I've taken two classes with John. The first was, uh, oh no, now I'm about to forget the name of it. Um, <laughs> Amer it's very important to get the, the words right because of reflexive turns and things uh, with John Graham. But American Indian Religions and Ecology, um, as well as Religion and e Ecology and Cosmology with both John and Mary Evelyn. Um, and uh, I've had the pleasure, as I mentioned, of having John as my senior essay advisor. Um, and as a senior essay advisor, John is pretty much ideal because um, on the one hand, when I go into his office in a state of panic because I have no idea what to do with all of my senior research, he'll hold my hand the whole way along and like outline my essay, uh, you know, not for me, but with me, um, and really helps in that way. And then on the other hand, uh, he sort of has given me free reign to go run off and do what I want and then come back when I'm in a state of panic again. Um, so. The, the hand gesture that he's used for other things that I call to mind is one um, that makes me think of St. Francis on this day. Having your hand held out, palm open, with your uh, bird seed or wisdom or whatever it is in hand, not, not being force-fed, um, but also not having to pry the fingers out from the hand either. They're available, that wisdom or bird seed or whatever, for when you want it or when you need it. Um, in class, I think, uh, there are many great professors at Yale. Um, however, they do not all have amazing pedagogical techniques. Um, and one of the things I really appreciated about being in class with John is the way that we're not just reading the works of theorists, we're reading the works of academics who um, had lived experience. We're focusing on articles um, about what's contemporary and political. Uh, we watch a lot of documentaries, um, which I guess is to say that the study of indigenous religions could be something that's very cold and colonial and put on paper, um, but when John leads a class about indigenous religions, it's vibrant and alive and very political. Um, and I think that's really important. Uh, when you first meet John, at least when I first met him, what struck me is how he has that northern um, care. He 
and Mary Evelyn uh, in their classes, it becomes very clear that they really care about all of their students and they want to hear their stories and know where they're coming from and that personal experience um, of mind and body is not something that you have to leave at the door when you enter a classroom, but is a big part of learning. Um, and I've had a, lot, a couple of days where I'll be walking in Croon Hall, uh, which is the, um, where the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies is located. And you know, maybe it'll be a rainy day or maybe I won't have gotten enough sleep and I'll be in a pretty bad mood walking with my head down. And then I'll run into uh, John, Professor Grimm, and he'll say, oh, Patrick, how are you doing today? And he'll really look you in the eyes um, and make, you, make it known to you that he is completely making time for you and he cares about how you're doing, um, not just in a scholarly fashion, but in a personal way. Um, and that's really empowering and something I've appreciated. On the flip side, uh, when you take his class, you realize that um, in addition to being uh, uh, that friendly person from those frozen states up north, uh, he also cares very, very deeply about his subject matter. Um, just ask him a question about uh, probably like reservation life or something, and all of a sudden, like you'll see that inner flame come out and how passionate he really is about the well-being of people and the planet. Um, so, uh, in addition to being an activist and um, a, a deeply caring person, I think perhaps above all, John Grimm is a storyteller. And um, like good storytellers, sometimes his stories don't uh, make immediate sense um, or even sense after a couple of months worth of reflection. Uh, <laughs> but that's what keeps you coming back to the story. So, um, what I what I remember is um, after being in his class for a semester and understanding how he teaches and understanding how he communicates ideas, um, being in class on the first day of religion, ecology, and cosmology last semester, um, in a class full of people who uh, haven't yet learned the way that John Grimm teaches. And um, to describe his teaching style, he told a story. Um, and that story was uh, biblical scholars, pardon me if I get this completely wrong. Um, but that story is of uh, Joshua and tearing down the walls of Jericho through the power of music and how God planted this little idea in his head and so they, uh, you know, sheathed all their weapons for the moment, pulled up their drums or trombones or whatever they had back then, marched around the walls making a mighty, a mighty din and then the walls collapse and victory is had. Um, and in John Grimm's own words, this is what his teaching style is like. Um, and I think about two of us who'd had him before sort of nod and scratch our heads at the same time, uh, and everyone else uh, is just scratching their heads. But uh, after a few months of taking his class, and I hope um, after a few, mo a few minutes of hearing him talk, you'll start to understand what that means. So, in closing, um, words cannot define John Grimm, but uh, I've just tried to do that. <laughs> How good it is to be with all of you. Now, Patrick, thank you for those remarks. After them, I'm inclined to feel like uh, the one who holds out the bird seed, huh? That's how you put it? Well, I feel like the bird brain. <laughs> how can the bird brain give anything that's worthwhile to you all? But isn't that the joy of being together on a day like this? It's like uh, the birds. We've come together to get uh, comfort and a little warmth in this, uh, this day together, this rainy day together. Now, uh, I'm uh, called uh, the moderator of the youth panel, and here, Ben, we haven't had a chance to meet yet. Ben and Patrick's here, and Frida's here with the little one. So the panel is here, and are you all willing to give me a few minutes? I'm going to talk about something, and then Frida, you're going to do the same, and Ben, you're going to do the same. Patrick, are you going to make a response to the whole panel or my remarks? I think I'm making a concluding statement to the whole panel. Okay, the whole panel. So that's what's ahead, all right? We have uh, this is the time together, and although I'm at the podium, 
we might all do that. Ben, you expect you're going to come speak here too? And prove that? Good. So get a sense of what's going on. Uh, as I as I said at the outset, uh, gratitude's important, and uh, it's important, I guess, because I feel it's the two legs I stand on. The gratitude that comes from within and gratitude that I know comes from without. Uh, I've put together some remarks about Francis of Assisi. Uh, this image that sits in the front of the podium is by Cimabue. It's uh, from the walls of the Basilica in Assisi. So that if you're, uh, those of you who have been fortunate enough to, uh, to visit, you perhaps have seen this uh, stucco uh, painting on the walls uh, mixed among the paintings by Giotto. So this is probably the oldest and the most realistic image we have of Francis of Assisi. And it's uh, Cimabue's uh, picturing of uh, the Pavarello. So I wanted to explore four points, all right, with regard to Francis. And I, I brought along an interesting text. This is the Omnibus of Sources, which a scholar by the name of Marion Habib put together. Uh, I have my own copy from my uh, studies at Fordham University with uh, your cousins. We mentioned Thomas Berry, our beloved teacher, so much, and I'd like to remember another beloved teacher, your cousins, uh, Patrick. I bought this book for one course. This was a course on Francis of Assisi. And I want to tell you, it, uh, it changes life, doesn't it? When you throw yourself into a subject and suddenly the, what you're studying begins to talk to you. And it, it never leaves. You know, I, I don't pick up this book very often. But I wanted to bring it along today and to read four passages and just to think about four issues that resonate with my thoughts about why does Francis appeal to us? Why does Francis of Assisi still have some appeal to our time? So the first thing that crossed my mind was uh, the social justice issues that were gathered together today and my uh, thoughts of Francis as Pavarello. And of course, I'm repeating a, a term of affection that was given to Francis of Assisi, the little poor man. And uh, that, uh, that image was cultivated by Francis himself very, very carefully in his life. He, he expected to uh, find a religious life. And in, the, in, his, early, uh, in his early life, he uh, intentionally uh, impoverished himself. He uh, sold the clothes and the arms that his uh, father especially had provided him with uh, to set him out in terms of a dream of military accomplishment. And uh, Francis had, had early in his life a sickness and this sickness turned him and it turned him away from uh, what uh, at the time he might call things of the world and we might revisit that term world now and think of it maybe affluence. It turned him away from affluence and uh, he set out to find a vision which he associated with being a hermit and uh, gradually he distanced himself from several uh, issues that are uh, important for our consideration, uh, namely uh, his uh, family business, his father's business, was uh, moving cloth between France and northern Italy. Uh, Francis, actually his original name was John, and he was given the name Francis by his family as a nickname to honor the, the country where his father was uh, making his fortune. So Francis was raised in that whole entrepreneurial commercial activity that we might associate with the market, which of course uh, largely defines so much of our life. And Francis turned from that. His sickness began to turn him, but his uh, further reflections and the dreams that he had began to turn him. 
until there came the time when he uh, he left, he renounced that way of life, and his father attempted to force him back into uh, the family business. And uh, Francis uh, was uh, approached by the civil authorities, and uh, he was commanded to appear in front of the, the governance in, of Assisi, whom the father had co-opted. He refused. The father then went to the bishop, and Francis could not refuse. And this is the episode that's reported in the, the lives of Thomas of Celano, who wrote this, uh, Francis's life is 1181, to 1226, and Thomas of Celano began the first life about 1229, so it's a fairly close reporting. And it said if uh, when Francis was brought before the bishop, he would suffer no delay or hesitation in anything. Indeed, he did not wait for any words, nor did he speak any, but immediately putting off his clothes and casting them aside, he gave them back to his father. Moreover, not even retaining his trousers, he stripped himself completely naked before all. The bishop, however, sensing his disposition and admiring greatly his fervor and constancy, <coughs> arose and drew him within his arms and covered him with the mantle he was wearing. He understood clearly that the counsel was of God, and he understood that the actions of the man of God that he had personally witnessed contained the mystery. He immediately, therefore, became his helper in cherishing him and encouraging him. He embraced him in Francis's act of charity. I wanted to uh, open with this first consideration of uh, poverty, Francis willingly undertaking poverty. And in terms of our own reflections today on uh, consumption and consumerism, that uh, Francis, I don't think he turned from consumption. I think we all of us eat, we all of us breathe, we all of us enjoy standing around the fire today. That sense of consumption is something that uh, we are by our very nature. But the consumerism, affluenza, or the overwhelming drive for acquisition and intense security, I think that's what Francis was feeling also as uh, uh, something he turned from. So in our own times, we begin this reflection on consumption and consumerism. We're trying to uh, understand these two issues. The second point I wanted to um, explore with you was an issue that I'm sure you all remember when uh, Francis, uh, he goes uh, in this journey then of uh, inquiry in his uh, uh, road of poverty. And uh, one of the first places that he comes to is the little church of San Damiano. And uh, this particular uh, passage is recorded of Francis's experience at the little church in, in San Damiano, outside of Assisi. Changed now perfectly in heart, and soon to be changed in body too, he was walking one day near the church of St. Damiano, St. Damien, which had nearly fallen in ruin and was abandoned by everyone. It was a, uh, an old uh, uh, Greek Orthodox church. So the Greek Orthodox tradition had penetrated into northern Italy. And so that crucifix in, at San Damiano is actually out of the Orthodox church. Led by the Spirit, he went in and fell down before the crucifix in devout and humble supplication. And smitten by unusual visitations, he found himself other than he had been when he entered. While he was thus affected, something unheard of before happened to him. The painted image of Christ crucified moved its lips and spoke. Calling him by name, it said, Francis, go, repair my house, which, as you see, is falling completely to ruin. Trembling, Francis was not a little amazed and became almost deranged by these words. He prepared himself to obey and gave himself completely to the fulfillment of this command. He took it literally. Huh? 
he began to repair the church at San Damiano. Uh, there's so much in these uh, passages, the sickness, the intense uh, character of the, the visionary character of his life. But this uh, vision of uh, go and uh, repair my house, it's, um, it's the vision of our own times too. You know, we, we have a sense of our house, the ecos, uh, upon which the word ecology flows and our sense that uh, our own house is in need of deep repair. And so Francis is one of these bridging personalities who's uh, totally within the sphere of the tradition that he comes out of. He it turns towards this church where the vision was experienced and he begins to repair the church. And eventually he has other dreams, one of which is uh, the black hen. He has a dream of uh, a hen who has all these chicks around. And uh, he gathers, the hen gathers the chicks under its wings. And he begins to understand that that dream is, uh, is the church calling in all of the chicks to protect them. And he moves from that limited understanding of repairing just the church at San Damiano to the sense of the institutional uh, church, the Catholic church. And he literally goes to Rome and brings uh, his first rule to Rome for approval. So this image of the house, Francis himself, he saw it expanding in his own life. And so it's not surprising that we should be influenced by a reflection on Francis, uh, his understanding, go repair my church, repair my house, that we can see how this vision expands out into a, our larger planetary consciousness today. Uh, this sense that uh, these personalities who speak to us from their own past, uh, they, uh, they need to be re reinterpreted, they need to be understood in our own times today. So the repair of our, uh, of our home. The, uh, the third uh, experience in Francis's life that I wanted to explore with you is a, uh, it's a powerful mystical experience of uh, Francis's vision uh, at the retreat uh, that the Franciscans eventually established at the Mount uh, Verna, La Verna. Uh, and uh, Francis had a rather striking image there which uh, changed his life, and Thomas of Chilano described it in this way. Uh, two years before Francis gave his soul back to heaven. So Francis's dates 1181 to 1226. This is uh, 1224 then. Uh, Francis, uh, his life turned, pivoted on this illness and the San Damiano events about 1206. So 25 years of age until 45. He had 20, a 20 year career in which he established the Franciscans and came to this larger vision of life. And this experience was uh, towards the, the very end of his life. Uh, two years while he was living in the Hermitage, which was called Alverna, after the place on which it stood, he saw in the vision of God a man standing above him like a seraph with six wings, his hands extended and his feet joined together and fixed to a cross. Two of the wings were extended above his head Two were extended as if for flight, and two were wrapped around the whole body. When the blessed servant of the Most High saw these things, he was filled with the greatest wonder, but he could not understand what this vision should mean. Still, he was filled with happiness, and he rejoiced very greatly because of the kind and gracious look with which he saw himself regarded by the seraph whose beauty was beyond estimation. But the fact that the seraph was fixed to a cross and the sharpness of his suffering filled Francis with fear. 
And so he arose, if I may so speak, sorrowful and joyful, and joy and grief were in him alternately. Solicitously he thought what this vision could mean, and what and, and his soul was in great anxiety to find its meaning. And while he was thus unable to come to any understanding of it, and the strangeness of the vision perplexed his heart, the marks of the nails began to appear in his hands and feet, just as he had seen them a little before in the crucified man above him. So this is the uh, vision that Francis had in the Feast of the Adoration of the Cross. Francis was obviously meditating on such an experience, and then he goes into his uh, silent uh, hermitage and he has this vision of the six-winged seraph. It's a powerful vision. It's a numinous vision, isn't it? it it's uh, fascinating and fearful. It's charged with beauty, and yet uh, it's terrible in its suffering and pain. Uh, so much of what we're reflecting on today is embraced in those descriptions and in those dispositions. The effect on Francis uh, is remarkable in the uh, stigmata that appeared on his body. So the vision left the mark on his body. And this sense of uh, embodiment is a very interesting a pathway for reflection into religious consciousness. What marks do our visions leave on our body? I'm uh, I'm struck by this uh, this sense of uh, what visions we have in our times of this uh, planetary devastation that uh, we humans have affected upon this earth and uh, what effect that vision will leave on our body. Uh, those of us uh, who are older know we're, we're maybe on the journey uh, from this life and we might not see that devastation ahead, but when we look in the eyes of our students and those young, we see our body in them. We see that mark that we're leaving on this earth. The Francis stood in that vision, alternately lifted up and uh, brought low. I'm struck by that also. We see the sad, bad news of our time as simply that, but I'm not convinced it is. I think the marks on our body, the devastation on this earth, are also capable of bringing us into an incredible vision of the future. And I think Francis was himself buoyed up in his moments of pain by realizing that also. What's accomplished, and it does not in no way try to ameliorate or soften the difficulties of suffering or pain or to try or wipe them away in some uh, a naive uh, realization, but rather to sense that this is a profound mystery that we live in the midst of. And Francis uh, went forward with the uh, marks on his body in terms of the vision that he experienced. Uh, finally, I wanted to reflect with uh, all of you uh, on the canticle of, of brothers, uh, brother son. It's such a beautiful prayer of praise that uh, Mary Evelyn, following Mary Catherine's uh, lovely use of the word this morning, to remember praise, how praise brings us across in all of our differences, especially our commitments, our religious commitments, our social commitments. Those differences uh, um, are paled when we join together in the sense of praise and they're filled with the meaning of the world that has surrounded us. And Francis's uh, experience came to him very late in life. Uh, it was in his uh, dying experiences that he wrote this canticle. It's said uh, by the monks who attended him that he was especially disturbed by the mice who were running uh, over his body. 
while he was in the course of Uncle Love. And uh, he uh, asked at one point for um, some paper so that he could write uh, the songs of praise that were uh, coming to him in his imagination. Uh, it's important to remember that uh, Francis in his name carries the uh, marks of some uh, strikingly uh, different influences coming out of the regions of France and northern Spain. We, um, we know, for instance, that the uh, Irish monks brought Christianity back into Europe and uh, many of those Irish monks, uh, as the images suggest, had a very strong ascetic direction. They had a sense of, uh, of uh, the uh, religious insight by deprivation, that by a renunciation of food, water, by depriving themselves, that they came to an intense religious understanding and experience. Francis was influenced by those uh, traditions, uh, but he also was influenced by the troubadours, the, the jongleurs, and in fact, uh, Francis described himself uh, using that term of it as a jongleur, and the French uh, junglers or the, um, the, the performances that were used at the time to uh, bring people into intense understandings of, of devotion, that Francis connected with those. So his uh, effort to pray in the canticle during a, a period of intense uh, suffering is indicative of, uh, again, Francis's uh, paradoxical nature that uh, he lived uh, with that capacity to see the inherent uh, contradictions within things and to be able to justify and live with and balance those inherent contradictions. In the canticle of Brother Son, he uh, speaks in this way. Most High, all powerful, all good Lord, all praise is yours, all glory, all honor, and all blessing. To you alone, Most High, do they belong. No mortal lips are worthy to pronounce your name. All praise be yours, my Lord, through all that you have made. And first, my Lord, brother, son, who brings the day and light you give to us through him. How beautiful is he, how radiant in all his splendor. Of you, most high, he bears the likeness. All praise be yours, my Lord, through sister moon and stars. In the heavens you have made them bright and precious and fair. All praise be yours, my Lord, through brother's wind and air, and dare we say it, Sister Rain, <laughs> and fair and stormy, all the weather's moods, by which you cherish all that you have made. All praise be yours, my Lord, to Sister Water, so useful, lowly, precious, and pure. All praise be yours, my Lord, through Brother Fire, through whom you brighten up the night. How beautiful is he, how gay, how full of power and strength, all praise be yours, my Lord, through Sister Earth, our mother who feeds us in her sovereignty and produces various fruits with colored flowers and herbs. All praise be yours, my Lord, to those who grant pardon for love of you, through those who endure sickness and trial. Happy those who endure in peace. By you, Most High, they will be crowned. All praise be yours, my Lord, through Sister Death from whose embrace no mortal can escape. Woe to those who die in mortal sin, happy those she finds doing your will. The second death can do no harm to them. Praise and bless my Lord and give him thanks and serve him with great humility. Let me sing out uh, a couple of points. The Francis's inherent sense of the capacity of the world around to praise the divine. It's, it's an important consideration for us to recover, I think. That sense of the world as offering praise. And secondly, the second death. Uh, Francis seems to have uh, had an unusual 
experience early on in his life by a sickness that brought him close to a first death. And so I think he sees that first uh, death as so crucial that the second death is diminished then. And so again, I'm uh, drawn to our own times where we feel the sad, bad news of the environmental devastation as a, a first death, our reflections upon what we have done. And yet, uh, it prepares us also for that second death where uh, Francis uh, brings us to that realization that it doesn't have the hold on us. And we are, by our first death, have walked through something that brings us to a deeper understanding. So with the Chimibui's uh, image in front of us, uh, let's go forward into this discussion uh, with the next presenters and uh, see where uh, Francis uh, guides us in these moments together. Thank you. Um, so, right. So I am, uh, I'm really happy to be here, uh, really grateful to be included in uh, this this conversation, this vital conversation. Um, can you guys hear me okay? I feel like I'm talking maybe too close to the mic. Am I? No. No, I'm good? Good? Okay. Louder. Louder. All right. Hello. Yeah. Um, so I, I thought I, I wasn't really sure what I was uh, going to say. Um, uh, or how to how to fit fit uh, my experiences and sort of thoughts into this uh, framework. Um, I thought I'd share a few stories, offer a few reflections from the sort of frazzle um, and distraction of uh, motherhood. Um, and I'm uh, really grateful to my mother-in-law, Joanne Sheehan, who is a uh, quite an activist. Um, and, uh, and thinker and doer uh, of nonviolent resistance who's here today and, um, and doing the hard work of trying to keep my grumpy little child happy. Um, she's got two little teeth coming in down here, so um, that's, that's her problem, uh, Madeline's problem today. So, yeah, a couple stories sort of at this intersection of, of peace, justice, and, and hopefully ecology. Um, my uh, husband is a second generation uh, peace activist too, and uh, my, Joanne tells this story of uh, how when he was a little kid, um, you know, there's some sort of gathering going on and uh, all the kids were under a table. They were sort of sitting around in a circle under a big table and uh, oh, they were very focused on what they were doing. And of course you always get worried when the children are quiet, right? So at some point uh, an adult comes over and says, they're sitting around in a circle, they're, they're talking uh, gibberish, right? Even the ones who are old enough to talk. <laughs> and uh, on and on this goes, and the adults are sort of watching it, and then finally, you know, like, what are you doing? We are having a meeting. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're doing, we're having a meeting. They were, that's what, yeah, they were meeting, they were planning, and um, somebody was definitely in charge, I think it was my sister-in-law, my husband's older sister, Annie. Um, I read not too long ago that this is what children do, this is what children have always done. Right? They watch the grown-ups around them, and they play uh, what their grown-ups do, and what their grown-ups work. Um, and if you're children have seen you work, they have integrated it into their play. Um, and it's evolutionary, right? It's, it's an important uh, component of child development, along with, it's how, you know, our forebears learned to hunt and to forage and to farm, uh, how to worship, right? How to take care of uh, the planet is by watching uh, their grown-ups uh, do their work, right? And uh, they try on different roles within the family and society. They learn how to navigate uh, the world. Um, and so when I was little, when my brother, who's uh, just a year younger than I am, uh, and I were little, we would play protester. <laughs> we played all the time. Um, we had this uh, tall row house, right, and this uh, steep set of uh, marble stairs, and then this big kind of dramatic door. And uh, we would fill up baby bottles with water. Um, the water was pretend blood. Uh, we would close the door of our house, 
I'm going to be down at the bottom of the stairs. Then we run up to the top of the stairs. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, no war, no whatever. Uh, um, whoever wasn't doing the blood throwing would be the police officer. Uh, wrestle the other ones to the ground. And then march us off to the, you know, one of us off to the paddy wagon. Uh, I learned recently that's a pejorative term, so it's a, 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 a prisoner conveyance. Uh, anyway. um, if the game was good, the protester would continue to testify uh, throughout the arrest, maintaining a noble, noble sort of nonviolent stance. Um, but most of the time, uh, this game devolved into simple plotless, unredemptive roughhousing that had us sort of rolling down the hill um, on our block. And our neighbors going, there go those Berrigan kids again. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Um, so sometimes we would put ashes, you know, we would do ashes too. It wouldn't just be the water. We would gather ashes from our wood stove and um, get a little bag and get the ashes and throw the ashes at the front of our house too. Um, now, this was really challenging. The adults made it look easy at the Pentagon, uh, but it was really hard. Uh, you had to throw it smoothly. Uh, you had to get them out and spread out. Otherwise, it just looked like a pile of ashes on the step. There was nothing haunting or evocative or profound about this like pile of ashes, right? Either way, it was a pain to clean up, right? So we only we only used that occasionally. The water would just sort of take care of itself, right? Thankfully, we never got around to putting, um, you know, dye in the water, right? We kept it pretty simple. So we learned these games from, uh, we learned this play from watching our mom and our dad, uh, uh, Liz McAllister, Dan, uh, Phil Berrigan, that's my father. <laughs> Phil Berrigan. Uh, friends, community members, mark the Pentagon, mark the Department of War with their blood um, and get arrested uh, so often there growing up. This even got incorporated into our holidays. Right around Christmas, uh, a doctor friend would come and uh, he would take blood from all the grown-ups, right? And this is sort of like part of Christmas Eve. Oh, like so-and-so's coming over for dinner and like everybody's gonna give blood and drink orange juice and stuff like that. And so, um, so and then the blood would get, and, and then there was another guy who would, uh, his job was kind of to like go to hospitals and like, Da, 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 and like take bags of you know blood, and, you know the needles and the empty bags, so that we could use these. And none of this stuff can happen anymore. But um, and then the blood would live in our freezer, right? Um, and which I think is disgusting. And I have a placenta sitting in my own freezer right now, which is just really bothering me. Yeah. Before the ground freezes again, and we can't uh, do anything with it. Anyway, so this blood, right? What was it? What was, why did we do this at the Pentagon? I was supposed to remind the workers of the Pentagon that even though they went to work in this clean, antiseptic, beautiful, it is a striking building, right? Uh, they went to nice offices every day. The work that they did shed blood all over the world. Um, and often they would walk right through the blood, right, on their way into work, tracking brown stains down the hallways of the Pentagon, right? Uh, the ashes were used to remind the workers uh, of the people turned to ash, literally turned to ash, vaporized in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Bombs that incinerated tens of thousands of people in a, in a single instant, in a heartbeat. Many of you have been to the Pentagon. The, the pillars are made of white marble. They're extraordinary pillars there. Uh, and the blood uh, thrown from these baby, baby bottles would um, you know, splash bright and red, nearly indelible, uh, onto the pillars of the Pentagon. This, you know, extraordinary image. Um, and it would soak into the marble as though it belonged there, kind of. Uh, the marble would soak it up uh, so fast. It would go from being wet to almost dry immediately, um, like water into a sponge. Um, and, and kind of after the people would get arrested, the maintenance workers would come by, and, and these were, you know, mostly African-American older men dressed in these um, green uniforms, 
Um, and I remember, I have these, I, if, if, if one of these guys walked by today, I would totally recognize them. These are such a, these guys were such a part of my childhood. Uh, there was one uh, man who only had one arm, and he kind of had his uniform pinned up on his shoulder. Um, and it was their job to spray bleach and water and scrub and clean um, uh, the blood away. And this is their, this was, I mean, they did other things. I'm sure they're cleaning up messes all the time. But they were tasked with protest cleanup. Um, they were grim guys. Like, this was not a fun job for them. Made even less fun often because, um, you know, the uh, people would say, you can't wash the blood away, you can't wash the blood away. Sometimes people would try and blockade them from doing their work. And that always seemed a little, meh, you know. The, it did get washed away. It does wash away, right? And, um, and they were not really the object of our protests. They should not have been the people we were directing our message to. Um, they were cleaning up our, our mess. It made me uncomfortable that we were sort of pitted against the janitors instead of the generals uh, in that way. Um, after uh, we all began to learn about AIDS, um, these guys would also wear these kind of like full body hazmat suits and big gloves and helmets and respiratory kind of things. And um, that also made me, you know, kind of think again about like how far we wanted to go for this particular image, right? Um, when the police knew we were coming to protest, they would um, have the maintenance people wrap the pillars in plastic, like big <laughs> pillar condoms would get put on it. And uh, that was probably a lot of work, and it did not look nice. It kind of ruined the whole effect of these dramatic, gorgeous pillars. Um, but it did protect the pristine marble, right? And over the years, and this is how we kind of have to measure success sometimes, or this is where we get. Um, the pillars did get appreciably, you know, kind of a little skinny at points, you know? A little, le oh, yeah, we're making an impact here. We are wearing away the pillars of the Pentagon with our uh, blood and washing year after year after year. Like drops of water carving rocks through millennia, we are changing the Pentagon with our actions and our presence. Eventually, however, they, they, they sprayed some sort of polymer um, onto the whole, you know, thing, and so the blood would just kind of like pool and then just kind of like, you know, go off. And um, I don't remember sort of where our game went. Um, the blood, the ash, the mess, the protester, the, the, uh, the police officer, where my brother and I went uh, with this game. We, we stopped playing it at some point. We moved on to other things. Um, that kind of protesting at the Pentagon also ended. Um, not even the most intrepid protester can get anywhere near that riverside entrance uh, of the Pentagon anymore. Uh, the whole complex was redesigned after September 11, 2001, and most of the building is unapproachable. There's no surrounding the Pentagon uh, anymore, with no matter how many um, people uh, you bring there. Uh, people do, uh, from the uh, Dorothy Day uh, Catholic worker in Washington, D.C., from uh, Jonah House, where I grew up, do continue to have a weekly presence at the Pentagon, um, but they're kind of, they're in this like little free speech zone, like uh, we're all familiar with in different places, um, and, uh, you know, we're like way far back from the actual building. To hand a uh, worker a flyer is an arrestable offense at, at the Pentagon. Um, I think our game uh, reflected um, our parents and our friends' seriousness uh, about uh, their work. Um, but I also think in switching back and forth between being a protester and being a police officer, my brother and I got to experience the affrontedness, the exasperation, um, as well as the outrage and the rectitude and the sort of moral righteousness. Um, that uh, was a part of the dynamic that we saw uh, at the Pentagon, right? Um, the game did not want me, uh, did, the game did not make me want to throw blood at the Pentagon. Uh, nor did it make me want to be a police officer and arrest people um, uh, for my living. Um, and uh, uh, so, just sort of thinking about games, particularly now as uh, my own children are sort of getting to the age where they're starting to to play games and to be um, aware of what the grown-ups around them are, are doing. Um, 
I meant to bring my uh, cell phone up here so I could uh, keep track of time, um, but I, I didn't. So I'm going to look at Suzanne for a picture of her cat and somebody and say, how much time do I have to speak to these freezing cold, wet people? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, I could go on the spot there. So, and uh, yeah, we're good. Um, I could launch into a whole other kind of piece of the talk or wrap up, so I'm just trying to decide what I can do that. Okay, all right, so I'll skip that all. I'm moving right along here. Um, you know, I, I, so it was mentioned in the introduction of me that Witness Against Torture and um, Paki and Cheryl and some others uh, who are here are part of Witness Against Torture. Um, and uh, this walk that some of us did in 2005 uh, in Cuba to go to Guantanamo to visit the prisoners. Um, we really wanted the Bush administration at that time to arrest us for violating the travel-related um, embargo against uh, Cuba and give us an opportunity to put uh, Guantanamo on trial in Washington. Um, and that didn't happen, but uh, Witness Against Torture grew out of that, and I'm happy to sort of talk more about that. Um, Q&A or whatever uh, when it happens. I'll say that there is a gathering in um, in New York uh, on Monday uh, to fill the courtroom um, for a, the, a hearing of a man who's in Guantanamo and uh, uh, putting forward um, legal what uh, objections uh, to the way in which he's being force fed. Right, he's been on hunger strike there. Um, basically since arriving at Guantanamo in 2003, um, he basically hasn't eaten of his own volition that entire time. Uh, uh, B-H-I-R-I something. Um, so, uh, so there's a hearing uh, in New York City and uh, a call to, to fill the courtroom there. And on the Witness Against Torture website, witnesstorture.org, there's more in information about that. Um, we'll also be gathering in Washington, D.C. again in January 2015. Um, January 11th, 2015 will mark 13 years, 12 years, uh, since the beginning of Guantanamo as a, as a holding place. This is a particularly sort of resonant issue at this exact moment, right, as um, as Americans are being held in captivity uh, by ISIS. Uh, well, a, a British aid worker uh, beheaded, we learned about it yesterday, right? Clad in an orange jumpsuit, right? He's made clad in orange jumpsuits. A, a direct visual experiential link back to um, our treatment of, of men um, uh, in this kind of global war on terror um, rubric. Um, so kind of coming to wrap up. So as I said, you know, my husband and I uh, both raised in a resistance community, second generation peace activists, and it's nice to be here with Claire Schaefer Duffy and, and her son and, uh, uh, and their daughter, um, and uh, to know of other, you know, many generations of, of this work. Um, and I look around, I read the newspaper, and I think, is the world better as a result of my parents' efforts, the, the efforts of my husband's parents, the efforts of so many. So much hard work, so much resistance, so much organizing, meetings, actions, campaigns, jail time, um, just, you know, over the last 40 years of my life, right? Can't call 40-year-old a youth anymore. I am not a youth. Um, but I, I still uh, am very sort of youthful. Um, although more of my hair... Uh, silver than brown at this point. Um, what lies ahead? What will our kids look back at 40 years from now? What will they remember of my efforts, of my husband's efforts, of the efforts of the young for people who are here? Um, and, you know, thinking particularly about sort of this interesting juncture within the climate justice movement, um, and this kind of interplay between the big organizations and the like, and the more radical elements, and sort of this dialogue between 350.org and uh, um, Flood Wall Street, and the sort of tensions there, uh, and then also the collaborations and the the 
the, you know, that, that dynamic fringe, that dynamic edge uh, that I was talking about earlier. You know, I think about my own parents as, you know, not being community organizers um, in the um, Obama sense of the word, in, the, in any sense of the word. They didn't speak to the movable middle. Um, you don't really speak to the movable middle by throwing blood on the Pentagon <laughs> or, by, um, or by hammering on uh, the nose cones of nuclear weapons, right? Uh, you do speak, and you speak prophetically, but you don't, you don't, um, you don't move the middle, right? They're resistors, witnesses, prophetic challenge, nonviolent provocateurs. They said, walk through our blood to go to your office jobs. <laughs> walk through uh, our ashes uh, to go to work, step over our prone bodies and the bodies of our children, because we love dying in at the Pentagon. We <laughs> thought it was really kind of fun. Um, sometimes five, sometimes 50, sometimes 500 people, um, but it didn't, those numbers never really mattered all that much uh, to them. Um, you know, my mom just recently got arrested at, at the Pentagon, she'll be 75 in November, um, for handing a piece of paper uh, to a worker, and she's uh, going to be in court in early December. Um, I guess, I, not I guess, I am, I am very proud of this, uh, this legacy, this heritage, but um, there is something, you know, in thinking about my, my play as a child and, and thinking about all of this, um, there's something about my vantage point as a child at the Pentagon. Um, something about watching the people that I love, the people who I love, um, and, uh, and the well-dressed and uniformed uh, strangers, um, and watching sort of this set of interactions between them over all of these years. The horror, the disgust, the shock, resignation, um, you know, the kind of... This is how people were reacting to the people that I love, and um, there's a lot to think about in that. Uh, it's something I'm, I'm thinking about. I don't have any big answers about it, but I, um, but I think about it. Something about our game, where my brother and I placed our sides, uh, ourselves on both sides of the action, um, makes me think now about um, what we can do uh, to reach across uh, rather than exacerbate differences, to invite conversation uh, rather to, than to even nonviolently sort of provoke a conflict. There's so much dynamic, uh, there's so much fecundity, uh, creative nonviolent resistance right now. Um, some are reactive, reacting to grave injustices. Uh, you know, the, what's happening in Ferguson, what's happening around the country as a result of that police murder, right? Some is creative, like this flood Wall Street uh, action that happened. The fast food workers who are on strike for a living wage. The high school schoolers. High school schoolers? High, sc high schoolers. The high school students uh, walking out, you know, just this week uh, to protest how civil disobedience and organizing and the sort of the tough pieces of U.S. history are trying to be pushed out of the curriculums. Um, the plowshares movement, nuclear weapons finally, um, you know, gaining uh, attention because of the actions of of, uh, of of nuns in their 80s and Catholic worker uh, men in their 60s. Um, so, you know, what what's next? What's next as the planet warms, as our resources shrink, as our world grows more? and more interconnected? How do we keep on keeping on? Um, and how do we act simultaneously in, a, in ways that are smart and strategic and prophetic and nonviolent, and in ways that, uh, that, that are risky to ourselves, uh, risky to ourselves? Um, how, what do we teach our children? What do we teach them with our words, uh, with our actions, and with our lives? Um, and those are some of the questions that I'm really grappling with right now, as I know um, all of you are, and I'm really grateful to be grappling with all of you, so thanks. All right. Brayton and I lay on many Pentagon floors with uh, Frida and <laughs> Dan and Phil, and I'll never forget, uh, we went to get arrested in front of the White House with vials of blood, and um, Liz made it in, uh, and Dan and I and Paul Hood were let were closed out, and there was a whole line of people waiting 
to come and observe all the Chippendale desks and so on at the White House. And Dan turned around to the gathered crowd and said, Someone spilled blood on the White House. <laughs> and everybody looked at Dan and, 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 and then he said, Who would spill blood on the White House? And everybody just looked around and there was this silence. And it was just such a vivid memory in my mind of uh, watching Liz then holding a banner in her teeth as the police were grabbing her other arm. And so all of these memories, including Frida Bear again and Liz and Jerry at Brayton and my wedding in 1980. So thank you, Frida. And I do want to invite um, Ben Thompson, who represents a incredible uh, synergy through his 350 work, and um, Shay Reister, who was one of our speakers last year, recommended Ben this year, and we're very thrilled to have hear about the kind of work that he's doing with the with the 350 organization in Cambridge. So Ben. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm really thankful to uh, be talking to you all. I'm going to talk a little bit um, about myself starting off. It's a safe topic for me to talk about. Pretty comfortable with it. Um, kind of an expert. Um, and uh, I'll try to speak to some extent for, um, for the people that I work with um, as much as I can uh, to give you a thought of, of what they're all thinking about. Um, I um, I first got interested in, in climate work. Um, well, it's 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 always a, li a little hard to tell. I I definitely remember learning about global warming in like elementary school. But I think one of the the big points when I really got interested is as a freshman in high school. I um, was really into science and stuff, and I, I went to a talk. Um, at the University of New Hampshire on climate science. And I was, um, you know, the first time I really learned about the crisis. And, um, and ever since then, um, you know, I've been doing what I can um, to, to address that. Um, I also, though, I, I think it might run a little deeper than that because once I was going through my old papers from elementary school and um, I found one, and it said, like, draw a picture of what you like, and I, I drew some candy, um, and then it was, draw a picture of what you don't like, and I drew, like, a, a smokestack, and I wrote pollution, spelled, like, P-L-O-S-H-I-N, um, which I really enjoyed. Um, I, went to, I went to college in Iowa, which is kind of a tough place to organize, because um, there's not... But the corn definitely outnumbers the people. And um, I also didn't know what I was doing. Um, so I flew a lot around a lot, which was, it was really hard um, to, 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 to know that this crisis was happening and to feel like there was nothing that I could do about it. Um, not only nothing that I could, nothing that I could do that would address the issue, but not even anything I could do that would make me feel like I'm acting on it, even if it's in ineffective action. Um, and I, I, um, but it, you know, I, I did the, you know, the 350 work days and the moving planets and stuff like that. Um, there was a great little uh, organic farm that a professor had, had left the school to go work on, um, or to start. And so we would go harvest potatoes and stuff like that. Um, which I, I loved, um, and it was beautiful, but um, not the political work that I wanted to do. And um, I, in college, I was, uh, you know, I was really focused on that, but I was really also really focused on my schoolwork and my grades. And um, I remember two, two things that I really always had in my mind was, um, I wanted, you know, this uh, a high GPA so I could get a uh, get into Phi Beta Kappa, and um, 
there's this uh, sort of uh, infamous mathematics competition called the, the Putnam exam. Um, and uh, the majority of people don't even get any points on it. And I, you know, I wanted to do well on that. I wanted to get in the top 500. And uh, one day my senior year, um, you know, my advisor called me into his room and he said, uh, and, and the whole math department was there, all um, <laughs> two and a half professors. Um, and they said, Ben, uh, c congratulations, you know, you got into Phi Beta Kappa, and uh, your, your Putnam scores came back, and you, you know, you did, uh, I think it was like, uh, uh, ranked like 316th out of, you know, the 3,000 odd folks that, that took it. And I thought, great, that's kind of cool, but I kind of like planned this rally today. <laughs> that's, that's where my mind really is. And um, I, I went out, it was the, I don't know if any of you remember the um, call foul on Congress uh, sort of themed rally, but um, I made a big cardboard cutout of our Senator uh, Chuck Grassley and put a big price tag on him. And uh, <laughs> folks would walk down to Ped Mall and uh, take pictures with him. Um, and it was, it, it was, it was really a admitted to be a disaster. Um, no one really came except for uh, I somehow got a reporter to come from Cedar Rapids. Um, and I was like, ah, oh, so glad you're here. No one else is. Um, so it was, that was, it was in some ways really painful, but it was also just an incredible moment for me to, to realize that my priorities were changing and my values were changing really for the better. Um, and I, as, awkward and painful as uh, that rally was. I really look back on it fondly. Um, I then, you know, came to Boston and finally found people, uh, other people working on climate and doing the kind of climate work that I wanted to do and was so relieved um, and excited to, to finally be, you know, after um, seven-ish years, which seems like a really long time in my life, finally be doing the kind of work that I, I'd wanted to do for so long. Um, and um, planned many actions, rest of the few times. Um, but I, you know, I, I want to touch on another story of um, when my, my priorities between academic and uh, activist um, collided, which um, happened you know, several months into my first year of grad school. Um, I, I really, I, uh, I was struggling to, to keep up with the, with the coursework and with um, the more important work. Um, and it was in, in part, uh, uh, to be honest, <laughs> due to the fact that I was just struggling with the coursework, because it's grad school and it's hard. Um, but in part, struggling with uh, uh, looking at that challenge and comparing it to the other challenges that we face, um, I decided uh, that I, I had to take some time off from grad school. And um, you know, the day I made that decision, I I cried, I sobbed <laughs> all the way down the red line and the green line to on my way to the 350 mass meeting, which um, I don't usually cry. I never cry in public, um, and it was it was scary because your whole life, you know, I I I, I had a path, you know, I, I knew what I was doing, and you know, I would do my homework and I would turn my homework in, and I know that I had done my homework, and I knew that you know what I was trying to do was get a degree, and the best way to get the degree is, you know, I mean, the the thing that you do to get towards the degree is the homework. And so, you know, there's no self-doubt about, like, is this the best way for me to get towards the, no, to just do your homework. Um, it's very simple, and, um, and then, you know, you get a job, and you get married, and yada, yada, yada. Um, and I felt like I was, you know, walking away from that, walking away from, uh, you know, walking into a, a, a scriptless life. Um, where I, there wasn't anything prescribed for me, and I had to write my own story and decide how best to, to move towards 
what needed to be moved towards. And um, that was terrifying, but it was um, what needed to be done. And then I uh, ran out of money, so I went back to grad school. Because um, <laughs> you get paid to go to grad school when you study math. Um, but <clears throat> I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be back at school. I, I just just returned. Um, I think it's it's a great great way to you know feed myself while um, having a flexible schedule and, and being able to um, organize a, a, a community. Um, and and now I'm here. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to, to touch on a little bit um, about intersectionality and, and, and some thoughts on that. Um, since the, there's been a lot of interesting stuff written on the, I feel, the internet in the past couple of weeks. I'm trying so hard to keep up with it. Well, with uh, People's Fund March, Blood Wall Street, and also um, David Roberts coming back from his sabbatical, um, who, who writes for Grist. Um, and I think, I think one of the discussions boils down to, I mean, it's, it's a really old discussion, but, but, um, who, who are we really trying to talk to? And I think, you know, there's the camp of, we're trying to, you know, we're, we're trying to, um, grow the, the far left and the, the camp of we're trying to move move the center. And I always I always go back and forth. And I think it's I think a lot of well I think it's somewhat related to, to what what brings me to the work. And um you know, I think one, one thing I remember as a child, my, my mother saying, is that you always have to look at things from um, other people's points of view. And I think I really internalized that to, to the point of sort of um, a, a radical self-doubt. And I really am very aware of you know, the, the stuff psychologists talk about um, with like the bystander effect. And, and as I study math, it's so certain, <laughs> um, in part because everything's so thoroughly qualified. Um, and to, to go from, from studying math to talking about movement strategy, um, it always surprises me <laughs> the um, the certainty with which people speak about their analysis, and I know I do it myself. You know, it's it's very so easy to um, think in, of you know have an idea and think it's the the best idea, and that every other idea is um, not a good idea. <laughs> But I always try and, and uh, remind myself of how incredibly complex the system is. It's, it's almost comical to think that, that we could understand exactly how best to, to, to move, move the parts and, and achieve what we're trying to achieve. And there's also a sense that we, we don't really have time to figure out the best way. You know, there's a professor at BU who said of, of divestment, I'm just not sure it's the best strategy. I, I think we're kind of past trying only one strategy. <laughs> we've, we've been sitting here for 30 years and not really tried that many strategies. I think it's time we try several strategies and so when I think about the discussion about who should we try and talk to, I think we should try and talk to everyone. And I don't think the same person needs to talk to everyone, and I don't even think that you know, the people talking to the center and the people talking to the left need to agree that they're, they're doing that. But I'm just happy 
anytime anyone talks about climate. Um, <clears throat> but one thing I, I do think is important is that um, as, as to where you, you, what work you do, is I think it's important that you do the work that you're called to do. <clears throat> because that's, that's the work that you're going to do most effectively. Which is, is um, it's a nice thought, and um, kind of not, I think it earth shattered that, but I think there's an immediate corollary, which is perhaps um, a little deeper, which is that the people around you should be doing the work that they're most called to. And I think we need to keep that in mind as we have these discussions about movement strategy, um, because I think it'll make make the discussion more more welcoming and more productive. Um, and I, another thing that I think this sort of gets to, and a thing that I think about a lot is is what you know what brings us to the work, and I think how that differs from what keeps us in the work. You know, I think what brings us to the work, we don't choose. But how we do the work in a way that keeps us there, we get to choose. And so I think I talked earlier a little bit about how I think what brought me to the work, I think I would call it a sense of um, wanting to do the right thing and a sense of wanting to be the right person which I think, I think, in a way, is kind of uh, self-involved to think that um, that what you can do makes a difference, and also that um, what kind of person you are matters. Which is not to say, I mean, I think I am that way, so I, I don't, I'm not knocking that so hard, but I, that's something I think about, and I think um, I think lots of different things drive drive people to the work. Um, but I think when you consider this work and the fact that you know I I, I don't like it when people talk about you know winning or losing because I think um, there's so much in between. But when we're probably going to not do well, <laughs> probably going to do pretty poorly, it's, it's, it's hard to, to motivate yourself to do that work. And I think, um, I, what I try and carry with me is not, um, not duty and not uh, anger or outrage and not fear. But I, I think when you do it out of a place of love, I think that's the most um, sustaining force that there is. Not that um, we don't have duty and not that we should never be angry. But I think to stay in the long haul, it has to be out of love. <clears throat> and I think, um, Oh, I think so many things. <laughs> ben, I think, I think we've been... Good time? Yeah. I did think of some things. Uh, apparently, I've been selected to speak for my entire generation, um, so I'm glad I don't have to actually do that now. Uh, uh, well, I guess first thing, um, I'm coming off of today feeling really empowered by a lot of what people had to say about activism and about the life of St. Francis and about... Um, the Earth Charter and the Earth Community. So if we could get a round of applause for everyone who's spoken to um, And uh, to, when I think of empowerment, I think about, honestly, I mostly think about like feeling good, like, yeah, I can do something. But the point of feeling empowered isn't just to feel good for a while, it's to feel like you have the power to do something, um, not power over, but power with. And um, for me, a part of having power with is about being realistic, which is also a part of uh, justice. And um, 
to me, being realistic in the United States of America from a position of privilege, uh, speaking myself as a uh, straight, cis, white male who comes from an upper or middle class background, um, it, it's not an easy thing to think about. Um, there's a quote from one of the Gospels where Jesus said, uh, says something along the lines of, um, to those who have been given much, much will be expected. And I think of how uh, I saw a statistic that um, a child born into the U.S. today over the course of his or her life will use approximately 40 to 50 times as many resources as a child uh, born in Bangladesh. Um, and so uh, I wondered if perhaps we could just have a moment um, of silent reflection uh, about our own complicity, but, um, you know, not in like a negative way, but thinking about our complicity and how we can resist systems and change things and the changes we can make in our own life um, because, uh, it, you know, complicity isn't just like, oh no, the glaciers are melting, it's, oh no, like there are frontline communities that are going to die if we don't change. Um, so, Again, maybe just a moment of silence for uh, those who are hurt by the systems that have been perpetuated. Um, thanks. Uh, I heard uh, in Frida's remarks some rather exquisite and developed reflections on transitions in her life as she watched her, her parents uh, making uh, straight, and the activists involved, making straightforward remarks without a sense of trying to move the political center. That's when, when you made those uh, comments about the, uh, who, what audience they were speaking to. And the sense in your own life then of reflecting upon that and seeing the need for perhaps a, a broader voice or a broader appeal. And Ben, your remarks at the very end, I, I felt like you were standing on the edge of a precipice and it was, it was really difficult for me, at least, to be with you at that moment where you were talking about the, um, the, very di the difficulty of feeling the overwhelming character of the problem and uh, uh, in terms of what we know, it, the effect it will have, and how do you bring people into a movement when it's this kind of overwhelming dynamic that you're up against. So, I don't know if you heard each other, but I, I heard something going on that I, I would like to ask that the ARC, if you could speak to one another about that issue of the, of the transitions in your life in this, um, this moment of understanding activism and of understanding issues. So I, I just read this interesting article. I didn't go to New York City for the, for the big uh, demonstration, the big march, or the... Um, resistance the next day, um, but I sort of consumed it all, I consumed it all, um, uh, through the power of the World Wide Web and uh, through hearing people's stories, um, and read a really great article um, by an old friend of mine, uh, uh, Matt Smucker, John M. Jonathan Smucker, and uh, it was co-written with another guy, um, really sort of challenging this, this dichotomy that had been set up, sort of 350.org and the sort of corporate climate change movement on the one hand and then these you know radicals getting arrested on Wall Street shutting it down the next day and really challenging that 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 wasn't as as uh, clear-cut um, as it was sort of being portrayed and that there was there, there was a lot of you know, people really wanting that to be much blacker and much whiter uh, than it really was. That, that there was dialogue, there was interplay, and there was a lot of collaboration that happened on those two days. Um, and that for the, move, for the middle to move, there does have to be a poll. Um, and there does have to be, you know, something risky and sort of dynamic happening. Um, and that that was really called for. Um, by those, um, and now I've lost them, by, by those most affected uh, by climate change, people living on, uh, on the edges, right, on the, um, uh, on the edges, calling for that through the climate justice movement. I, I can't remember all of the names of the different organizations, but um, I, 
so I, I found that uh, very provocative and, and good to kind of think about um, the prophetic witness and the the, the, the the risky actions happening in dialogue with and we saw that I think a lot with the, the plowshares action that happened at Oak Ridge um, where Perhaps it was the moment, perhaps it was the three people who did this action. Now I'm talking about Sister Megan Rice and Greg Forchi, Obed and Mike Wally. Um, or, you know, the fact that they embarrassed the uh, uh, Nuclear um, Security Administration so much by getting so far, penetrating so deeply into the, the heart of the nuclear security apparatus. Um, but, uh, but that was really accepted by the arms control community that was really welcomed in a way by the arms control community in Washington in a way that plowshares actions had never been in the past um, because they shone a light um, and uh, and because they um, I think it just because of the, the, the synergy of the moment um, and I think uh, there's a role for that and I guess what I want to see and what I, what I heard Ben talking about was um, was just everybody talking to each other and um, and uh, there is and I, I think our media and our culture sort of um, really li likes this kind of thing likes it for uh, you know a Chris Hedges kind of person to condemn you know like the action and, oh you know like there's this controversy happening um, but that that's perhaps sort of a theater that doesn't really speak to what people were experiencing on the streets in New York City uh, on either day or what people carry back to their own communities afterwards and the kind of movements that are, are being built and, and trying to be sustained. Okay, Frida, I'm hearing the, uh, the strong activist component in so much of your work, especially in the past, but the sense of provocative and raising the issue in a forceful way. And Ben, you're suggesting that this dem this march in uh, New York, which was the the buzz was very peaceful. the The whole effect was uh, very welcome. The anarchists, as I read, it was described to me, the police were walking on either side of the anarchists. They were hemmed in, and the anarchists were literally insulting the police. As they were almost as if they wanted to break out and do something provocative. But this whole event had a much different tone to it. So I'm sensing there's a, in the activist movement, there's, there's a very, is there a shift going on? Or am I reading it wrong? That there's this uh, readiness now to move towards uh, uh, trying to reach the center, to bring people on board by a, not, I don't want to say feel good, but a sense of good energies are coming out of this assembled event rather than the provocative event. I was there at the march. I felt the anxieties rise in me dramatically at one moment. Whenever, from the front of the parade, people started raising their hands. I knew the moment of silence was coming. I presume that's what it was about. I raised my hand, I turned around, and I watched the raised hands behind me. I go back to talking with my person who's next to me. Suddenly this roar comes from behind. In my life, I have been in, a, in the southwest, in the uh, areas where watershed floods happen. I was uh, almost caught in a flood. The sound coming from the rear alerted me, and I got out of the little valley I was in. That sound coming from the back was like a flood coming. The anxiety that rose in me was the anarchists have loosed. And now we now the real demonstration is going to happen. So you know, I was in that kind of moment. I was in that tension, thinking this that we're going to have to provoke something in order to get climate taken seriously. We need to provoke something. But Ben, I, I sense that's uh, that's not what you thought it was about, or felt it was about, or needed to be about. Well, I, I mean, I think on the the issue of climate um, that the. That we're, we're in dialogue with one another, we're in dialogue with, with policies and politics and um, corporations and, um, and laws, and, but we're also in dialogue with the, with the planet. And I, I think the real provocateur here is Mother Nature, right, who is 
um, you know, the people of New Orleans, you know, some of them were prepared for, you know, a flood, some of them weren't, but in the aftermath, people really had to, everybody had to respond, and, you know, those who were left standing had to recreate and, and decide to create something better um, there, and I think that's what, you know, sort of watching Occupy in New York kind of morph and evolve into like Occupy respond to Sandy and people really going out to the Rockaways and um, and you know they're already being a an anar anarchic infrastructure to meet people where they were and to respond to the needs of neighbors um, in those communities I think was really important and so I, I, I think there is a space for provocative action on climate change and um, holding corporations and governments and um, and big bodies to account um, but I think our we're also being provoked by 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 drought by flood by um, by you know the death of the bees and in all of these different things to create something new um, reading um, not to go on too long, but reading that New York Times article um, about there not being any water in the Central Valley and sitting at my kitchen table trying to explain to our seven-year-old, like, there's no water. Like, people have no water. And there's no institution that's helping people, right? Like, there's, there's, no, there's no there there, right? Like, so people are helping one another and... Um, and people, but people are also sort of in this perpetual, well, somebody's going to step in. Yeah. Somebody's going to step in. Somebody's going to sort of take this on. And week after week, month after, I mean, it's becoming months of, of no water. And there, it's nobody's responsibility because, and, you know, the water is not mu municipal. It's not, you know, there's no, there's no water authority. There's no, you know, if you don't have a well and if you don't have water, you just don't have water. And so people really needing to step step up and step uh, to one another and people are doing that but in a, such a you know this is the 21st century <laughs> like this is like we expect we expect something and people are drinking like water that they're getting from the fire department out of like these enormous tanks and they say well you're not supposed to drink it and they know that people you know and so then what's the next crisis that sort of you know snowballs from that is some sort of waterborne illness and dysentery and then all of a sudden you know we're not you know we're not the great empire anymore we're just like everybody else we have to boil our water and um, so so you know I, I, I see the well just to repeat myself I see the provocation coming um, you know coming from our relationship with Mother Earth and us being so alienated from that or you know really prepared to step in and, and help neighbor um, uh, however we define neighbor, and of course we have to define neighbor so, you know, our arms have to get so big to I I I embrace the neighbor. I just, you know, about the center, I think it's very important that the center mm -hmm. is reached. I think, from my experience, that the, the Fox News is winning right now, and um, that the center is either doesn't care or doesn't believe that climate change is even happening. And so uh, I think that's, you know, you were mentioning how there can't be just one way to, to make it happen. I think that somebody's really got to work on the center. Thank you. Yeah. We need to speak to everybody, you said. Yeah, yeah, in every way. And I think it's, it's, um, it's a, a great puzzle for me for actually how close we are to reaching the center because there, there's very contradictory polling that, you know, people, when given a list of things um, to rank, like importance, they usually put the climate crisis as the last. But when you look at, if you ask people, do you think the government should do more about climate change, it's, you know, around like 60%, which is outrageously high. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, several people were asking about the film, uh, Journey of the Universe, and the book, and the conversations. 
And we're going to leave a copy of all three of those here uh, at Agape and, and make sure we get some more to them as well. Um, so the film and the book from Yale Press and the series of conversations, um, which is 10 interviews with scientists and then environmentalists and so on, they're all available on Amazon. I'm sorry some of you don't like Amazon, and I understand that, but you can get them on Amazon. The film is also available on Netflix and so on. So we're leaving copies um, with deep, deep gratitude to Suzanne and Brayton and all the Agape community. And the final film I wanted to mention, which we'll also leave with them, is called um, Thomas Berry, The Great Story. And it's a beautiful film about Thomas, his life, his work, and so on. And uh, I recommend it strongly. So let's give a great hand of applause to Suzanne and Brady. And um, one of my roles is as the state coordinator for Pax Christi. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention the assembly that we are holding on November 1st at um, Holy Cross. And it is on the militarization of youth. And we've invited a minister from the Church of the Brethren to come and speak to us. He works with uh, various uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation, DePaul University, and other groups. And he has started a campaign called, um, let's see, I Will Not Kill campaign. So we would greatly appreciate if we had young, younger, college-age younger people with us.